Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, fabulous. Um, welcome. I am Jen, uh, Jen Wallison, Mayor of Menlo Park, and welcome to the City Council's April 4th regular City Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in the Bellhaven Branch Library. For those in virtual attendance, please note that there is a globe icon near the hand feature on your screen. This will allow you to listen to tonight's meeting in Spanish. Our interpreters this evening are Annabella Pidone, Ricardo Perez Delgado, and I wanna thank both of them for their time and service today. Buenas tardes. Tengan en cuenta que hay un icono de globo terráqueo cerca de la función de levantar mano en la parte inferior de su pantalla de Zoom. Activar esa función le permitirá escuchar la reunión de hoy en el idioma español. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, it's wonderful to be here in the community of Bellhaven this evening, and we're so grateful to all of you who have come in person and for those who are joining us virtually as well. Please note that depending on how many speakers we have for various items, we may limit the time on public comment. I would now like to introduce city council members and staff present. We have Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor, city council members Drew Combs, Maria Dorr, and Betsy Nash. Staff present include city manager Justin Murphy, city attorney Mira Doherty, and in the corner running the show is our wonderful city clerk, Judy Heron. City Clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the city council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. And again, echoing a welcome to our regular April 4th city council meeting. For members of the public who wish to provide comment on an item on tonight's agenda, if you are participating virtually, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen or if you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, you can press star nine after the mayor calls or comment on the item you wish to speak. For those of you that are in person, there are speaker cards at that back table right behind you. You could complete one of those and just return it to me up at this desk. Uh, the mayor will call on you during that uh, item you wish to comment on. I would also like to remind people that we are currently recruiting for all advisory body vacancies. Uh, recruitment is open through this Friday at 5 p.m. and information can be found at our website at menlopark.gov backslash commissions. That concludes my introductions at this time. Mayor Willison, please continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So we're going to start with C, which is agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members under city council member reports. Does any member of the city council wish to pull or modify any agenda item? I'm not seeing any takers. So we are going to move on to D, public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment, other than to provide general information. I will be calling for public comment this evening at the appropriate time for members of the public to address the city council on the following agenda sections. Presentations and proclamation, consent calendar, public hearing, regular business, city council initiated items, and informational items. And with that, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for general public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on an item not on tonight's agenda, participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me up at the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Daryl. Hey. 
Hey, good afternoon. Good evening. I just wanted to ask, who are the main uh, and most needy uh, community organizations that are working with the homeless in uh, Menlo Park? Thank you for your comments. Uh, excuse me, Daryl. Um, can I just ask a clarifying question? We couldn't quite hear the very beginning. Were you asking for what are the community organizations working with the homeless in Menlo Park? Yes, um, I work with an organization that wants to help the community organizations. I just want to find out who the main ones are or who are working with the needy in uh, Menlo Park. Okay, thank you for that comment. We're going to go through all public comment and then I'll have our city staff um, respond to your question. Thank you. Okay, so this will be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. And our next speaker will be Pam Jones. Good evening, Mayor Wilson, Vice Mayor Taylor, Council Member, City Manager and Staff. This is Pam Jones, uh, resident of Menlo Park in the Bellhaven neighborhood. And woohoo, thank you for being here. Um, really appreciate it. It's been a while and it helps to connect us. I also want to thank the staff for providing the virtual interpreters. Um, but there's a couple of things about public um, engagement that I that I wanted to touch on. And it's a reminder that not everybody um, uses smartphones and computers. And so they may not be able to sign up to receive all the announcements uh, about meetings, uh, policies, any other information uh, that comes out. Um, the other piece is, I think it would be nice to evaluate the tiers program or whatever uh, public engagement program that we are using now and in doing so to use data so that we actually know how successful we are and, um, and where we can improve uh, because there's always room uh, for improvement. Um, oh, the last piece that I wanted to uh, bring up, which I should have brought up earlier, just as a reminder um, that the um, uh, Bellhaven neighborhood population, actually district one, uh, the population, according to our redistricting documents, is 55.9% uh, 50, uh, that identify as Latino. So keep that in mind when we're having meetings over here. For the most part, um, you have been. But I think it's important that if we're going to reach people that, um, that we're accommodating. So again, um, thank you for the, um, the interpretation, the way it has been set up. Thank you for your comment. Okay, I am seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Wilson, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you, Ms. Joan, for your comment. And I would now like to turn it over to the city manager to see if he is able to respond to our public commenter, Daryl, who is asking about organizations working with the homeless or those who are not housed. Hello, um, just making sure that people can hear me in the room and uh, uh, remotely. So if not, please speak up. Otherwise, I'll start in on the response. So um, if, uh, if Daryl would be so kind to uh, reach out to the city clerk, we may be able to follow up with him on more specific information, but generally some of the organizations working uh, within City of Menlo Park are uh, Life Moves, Project We Hope, and uh, Samaritan House, kind of depending on the specific um, issue related to um, those that might be um, un unsheltered. So, uh, but that's kind of a, a quick overview of a, a few years working working well with. Thank you, City Manager Murphy. Um, so with the conclusion of our general public comment, we are moving on to our proclamations and presenta presentations and proclamations. Um, so first, uh, City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comments on items E1 or E2? Those are our two proclamations. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item E1, a proclamation recognizing April 2023 as National Poetry Month, or 
Item E2, proclamation recognizing April 22nd, 2023 as Earth Day. For those participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. For those of you participating in person, please feel free to complete a speaker card at that back table and return it up here at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on our proclamations, items E1 and E2. Seeing no hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So um, in uh, to help us with time this evening for both of the proclamations, instead of reading the full proclamation, I'm going to be summarizing the proclamation. Um, but the full wording of the proclamation is available in the agenda packet for your review. So our first proclamation is item E1, recognizing April 2023 as National Poetry Month. Launched by the Academy of American Poets in April 1996, National Poetry Month is a special occasion that celebrates poets' integral role in our culture and is a marvelous opportunity to celebrate the expressiveness delight, and pure charm of poetry. Over the years, it has become the largest literary celebration in the world, with tens of millions of readers, students, K through 12 teachers, librarians, booksellers, literary, literary events, curators, publishers, families, and of course, poets, marking poetry's important place in our lives. I would like to announce the second annual Menlo Park Youth Poetry Contest to celebrate youth literacy and creative expression. Original works of poetry on the theme, My Library, may be entered for consideration until April 24th. More information is available at menlopark.gov. And I very much look forward to um, seeing what our youth come up with in that poetry contest. Um, and I should have brought a poem tonight, but think of your favorite poem <laughs> um, as we honor Poetry Month. And with that, we're moving on to item E2, which is recognizing April 22nd, 2023 as Earth Day. Each year on April 22nd, people all around the world come together on Earth Day to celebrate the planet's environment and join together in promoting awareness for the health of our environment. Earth Day was founded in 1970 as a day of education about environmental issues and has grown into a global celebration, sometimes extending into Earth Week, which is a full seven days of events focused on green living and confronting the climate crisis. And I would like you to come celebrate Earth Day at this year's Love Our Earth Festival. It will be held on Earth Day, which is Saturday, April 22nd, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Menlo Atherton High School. This event has a free admission and is open to all. The festival will feature family activities for everyone, including Spanish and English story time, a lizard show, plant-based food market, bike repairs, and a maker space. And it's gonna be a great event. I encourage all members of our community to come out and um, enjoy, have a good time, and learn more about what you can do to celebrate our Earth. So now that we have, um, honored our two proclamation topics, we are moving on to F, which is the consent calendar. Under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion, unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on the consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Mayor Wollison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on any of our consent calendar items, F1, City Council meeting minutes, F2, uh, an award of contract for the 2023 street resurfacing project, or F3, uh, execution of an agreement to advance the Middle Avenue Caltrain crossing project. If you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return here to the clerk's desk. 
And this will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar items F1 through F3. Seeing no hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So um, does any member of the council wish to discuss an item on the consent calendar or make a motion? You just tell me. I'll make a motion to approve the. All right, Vice Mayor Except Vice that. Mayor Taylor has made a motion. Is there a second? To speak up. Uh, sure, sure. Okay, Council Member Nash is seconding the motion. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Taylor and a second by City Council Member Nash to approve the consent calendar. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none. By a roll call vote. City Council Member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Dower. Yes. City Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor. Yes. Mayor Wollison. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are moving on to G, which is our public hearing. Public hearings are a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed issue or action. Tonight's public hearing is G1. That is to consider an appeal of the Planning Commission approval of a use permit to demolish an existing single story, single family residence and construct a new two story residence with an attached garage on a substandard lot at 440 University Drive. And to introduce this item is our associate planner, Chris Turner. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mayor Wilson and council members. Um, so as you mentioned tonight, we'll be hearing the appeal for um, planning commission's decision to approve the single family home use permit at 440 University Drive. Uh, next slide, please. So quick um, agenda housekeeping. Um, I will give a very brief presentation and background on the project. Um, and we will hear from the appellant, uh, the appellant Ms. Elizabeth Howe, who is joining us at um, the Zoom. Uh, she's the owner of 83 North Avenue. Uh, we'll then hear from the applicant, um, Thomas James Holmes, the representative Aaron Hollister is here in person, um, and the architect from Dahlenberg is on the view of Zoom. Um, and then we'll hear um, so some quick project background. Um, this project was a single family residence that required a use permit as uh, a two-story residence on a substandard lot in the RWU zoning district. The lot is substandard with regard to minimum lot width and area. So it's about 52 feet wide, where 65 feet is required, and then um, about 5,200 square feet, where the minimum lot area is 7,000 square feet. In the, in the, in the, uh, the proposed residence complies with all the development standards of the RWU um, district, which includes setbacks, um, daylight plans, height, and floor area. Uh, the project does include an attached ADU. Um, so we just allowed to exceed the maximum floor area limit, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, and it is usually exempt from discretionary review. Um, next slide. Um, so for some context, this is the amended area plan to put in the, in the plan set. So the um, subject property is in the middle um, there, and the area plan is intended to show um, approximate distances to um, residences and other structures on adjacent properties. Uh, the appellant's property is planned north, so directly on top of the subject property, um, where you can see uh, the subject property abuts um, the appellant's property at the rear third, roughly. Um, this has been updated to include uh, an accessory building in the rear of the appellate's um, residence, which was not uh, previously shown. Um, it's about 64 feet from the proposed residence. 
And these are a few next slide. This is the proposed residence as uh, a two story home. And so the front and rear elevations are on top. You see in the front, uh, the second story step back from the front step back. Um, and in the rear is flush um, for a portion of the second story uh, that steps back quite a bit on the, um, on the left side. So near the left side on the elevation. Um, and then the bottom part of the uh, left and right elevations. We can come back to these if needed. Uh, next slide, please. Here is the uh, rendering that the applicant included in the plan set, um, which is a little bit more detail about um, materials and, and colors. Um, this is conceptual, so um, we don't usually. Include colors on uh, single family projects, so it would be somewhat subject to change, but we, um, the materials are uh, listed here. Next slide. So, the Planning Commission hearing um, on February 6th, um, we had one public commenter, which was the appellant, uh, who spoke in opposition to the project. Um, the Planning Commission generally was supportive of the design as a whole. Uh, they did have some, some questions about stairwell window location, um, so I knew what kind of privacy impacts those would create. And ultimately, um, there's the condition on the project to um, make that stairwell window obscure glass. Um, and then the project was ultimately approved for zero uh, two extensions um, and one uh, vacancy. Next slide, please. Um, so the staff's response to the appeal letter that we received uh, was laid out in more detail in the staff report, uh, but to highlight a few of the key uh, responses here. So in terms of the incorrect information um, that the appellant said was presented in the staff report and um, by the applicant, um, as I noted, we did receive an updated area plan showing the accessory building to the rear of the appellant's residence. Um, other than that correction, staff is uh, confident that the information in the plan set in staff report is accurate. Um, a point was made that the residents would block solar access uh, to the uh, Helen's yard. Um, so the residence would be a new two story house, um, but it does comply with setbacks, which is 20 feet in the rear, height limitation of 28 feet. Um, most residences roughly um, 26 feet or so, uh, and does comply with the daylight plane requirements, which all um, are intended to sort of mitigate any impacts to solar access. Um, and there aren't any unique features of this house um, that are creating any other accessory um, shadows or odd shadows. Um, and then the point about the ADU um, just being extra square footage. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, ADUs are allowed to exceed the maximum floor area limit on um, single family properties by up to 800 square feet to accommodate um, ADUs, both detached and again attached. Um, this one happens to be attached. So um, the floor area on this particular project is in compliance with um, the state law and our local ADU limits. Next slide, please. And then we did receive one additional piece of correspondence on CCI yesterday after publication of the staff report. Um, it was from the neighbor to the left of the subject property at 444 University um, Drive. They spoke in favor of the design of the, of the new house. Um, one point they, one comment they had was that they would like to see sidewalks installed. Um, Sidewalks are part of this project. It's included in the plan um, and it's a condition that we're going to do. Um, 
with that, I can take any questions and um, to go over to the Thank you, Mr. Turner. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so um, for members of the public, this is an official public hearing. So there's a very prescribed order and um, how we handle these types of items. So um, Mr. Turner, following the public hearing guidelines, um, please continue with that. Helen. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to be promoting our appellant. Elizabeth, you should be getting a notification to accept. Okay. Elizabeth, you should be able to engage your webcam and microphone at this time. And I okay. will be playing your presentation and you can just cue me to the next slide when you're ready. Uh, can, you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. 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 I am. Oh, uh, this is great. Can you hear me now? We are still yes. announcing. Can you hear me now? Try um, muting the audio of your device, but not your microphone the speaker. Gotta do that. Gotta do that. <laughs> Can you hear me better Can now? It's still an echo. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Do you have any other devices that are Projecting the meeting right now. I that am might you or off on you? my phone, and I muted and it, I muted it, and it was still it echoing. Was still echoing. My, computer my computer has a crackle, crackle in the speaker, in the speaker for, for audio, audio, but I can, but I can try and hang up and. Hang up and, hang up and hang up. Can you hear me better now? Oh, try, oh that again. try that again. Can you hear me now? That's it. Got, Got action. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm hearing a great deal of static. Um, anyway, we'll proceed. Uh, Mayor and council members, I am coming to you because you have the discretion to make a good project a great project. And there are some particularities of this um, developer's house uh, next to mine that can be improved to improve my quality of life. I um, wanna point out that if you look at my first slide, um, well, let me just say, I, my request is that the bulk of the house be moved toward the street. Uh, if you look at the house that is catty corner to the right um, and directly to the middle right of this project, you'll notice they're set much closer to the street with larger backyards that are separating um, basically the living area from the backyard. And I think there is an opportunity to move this house up to three feet closer to the street. And that the house and the rear yard is out of character with the res rest of the houses around it. If you look immediately around it, there is a triplex on university near it. And what the, um, what the figure one shows is that there is a little house, a large garage, and then a duplex that is on the corner of university and college. I would like to protect my current and future solar access. I have reviewed the applicants, you know, briefly in the last half hour, 
um, solar studies. And I would like to know who did them. And I would like an independent solar study done because I, I believe they're um, entirely, entirely inaccurate. Um, I would like to lower the height of the house by at least two and a half feet, if not more. It is a very tall two-story house. The applicant may point out that 444 University, the house immediately to the right as you're looking from the street, I'm sorry, to the left as you're looking from the street is taller, but that is a spire that is uh, not very big. It's part of a stairwell and it's, it, it has an open ceiling. So the rest of the house is much lower. The spire is taller and that house is set back at least 15 feet further from the fence line. They may bring up the fact that that house also has a garage, but it's much shorter and they've never used it. Um, Steve uh, Bittner and his family built a garage basically just to store stuff. I would uh, like to require some landscaping at the rear of the property that will help, you know, screen my property from their property, everything that they have in their landscape plan, except um, a deciduous tree, a uh, crepe myrtle is short. Um, I think that some simple design changes, which is in the purview of the city council uh, and are within building guidelines uh, and little cost to the developer would greatly improve the impacts on me and my property and my future development plans for my property. Um, I can put an additional ADU unit in my backyard. Of course, I wouldn't have it 28 and a half feet tall, um, but uh, because I don't want to, you know, spy on my neighbors, uh, and um, I, I'm I'm basically begging the city council to uh, require Thomas James take into consideration the impacts on me and my property and my property value with regard to. Uh, solar access and privacy and facing a 30 foot wall 20 feet from my property line. I I believe if you if you let let's go to the next slide please I'm sorry. I'm nervous. Okay. Um this uh picture shows most importantly, the fact that there is a lot of backyard in all of these houses. And if you look at the house directly opposite me on College Avenue, the one with the blue car out in front, you'll see that the second story of that house is set back from the rear of the yard. And in fact, from the first story quite a bit. Now, part of that first story is a covered patio. Um, so it does, it does look like the first floor is larger than it is, but that second story is set back considerably. Um, you'll also notice there are some redwood trees. Those have been trimmed, I believe, since these pictures were taken. And, um, and next slide. This is the rear elevation of the house. It has been included in um, the planning uh, department's presentation and um, the developer's uh, information. And that is a very high, very tall wall uh, overlooking my yard and house and is intrusive and isn't necessary. If they just set back that part of the second story a few feet and lowered the house uh, by a couple of feet, it would absolutely be fine with me. And it would not cast uh, what I believe are going to be some very bad shadows. And I really, I take uh, a great exception to the, um, the a solar existing solar study and and again with like an independent solar study done um and 
you know, in, in conclusion, I, I'm asking for your help. There is an ability if you look at, I'm sorry, can you go back to the first slide? And uh, down to the house rendering. Right. You'll notice that the ADU portion of the house is the closest to the street. They don't show in this rendering, at least as far as I can tell, and maybe you could blow that up a little bit. You know, the actual, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, they don't show that there is a covered entry to the house that uh, sticks out further. It's, it's hard to see in that picture. They, that, it's my understanding that that can go into the setback, that that covered entry roof, let's say, can go into the setback. And at the very least, if they can move the ADU unit back about a foot and a half, maybe two feet to align with the garage and bring the whole thing forward almost three feet, uh, even with the covered entry going into the front setback, it would at least get this house a little further away from my property and looming over my property with that huge wall of windows. Anyway, I, I, I'm not a developer. I am not a real estate agent. I am not an architect. I just know that this will impact my house, my yard, two heritage fruit trees that depend on light and vegetable garden and um, potential solar in, in an ADU unit in my own yard. And I think that the city council has the ability and the purview to request the small changes that I've asked for to make this a successful win-win project. I, um, I, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm interested to hear what the developer has to say. You know, this is an out of town developer who's experiencing financial issues. And um, I, I, I want a new house there. It will increase my property value. I just don't want it to loom over my house so dramatically. Um, I would also like to mention that Thomas James Home uh, did reach out to us in October. Uh, they made zero changes reflecting anything except for something the neighbor at 444 requested and um, ha have not returned any of my phone calls or emails since then. Um, I asked uh, Chris if it was possible that we could get, and, and Chris, help me out here, a stick uh, outline of the property to show the, you know, the, the massive wall and roof height and how, how it looms over my property. And I know that's something that's required in places like Portola Valley and Woodside, but that is also in the purview of the city of Menlo Park to request something like that, to really understand what the impacts are. And also that would give an opportunity for the neighbors um, on college who didn't think that this house would impact them to see if it really does or doesn't. The other thing that I would like is, um, I would love it if the council would require an independent solar study um, that didn't just deal with daylight plane, but dealt with the ability for my house to eventually have solar access. And being that this is Earth Day proclamation, I, I would appreciate that. Thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sorry if I'm a, a, a little discombobulated. Um, I, and, I, and I know the developer has the right to build a house, but he doesn't have the right to do whatever he wants where it impacts neighbors negatively. And um, I also think that the city needs to have um, 
something that protects solar access and it, and it doesn't. Um, anyway, uh, thank you again. Uh, simple changes could make a big impact and I appreciate your consideration and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, to refresh everyone where we are in the public hearing, um, that was our appellant. We are now going to hear from the applicant, um, which will then lead to a rebuttal from the appellant. Um, and in the interest of time, I, I believe um, we heard from about, about 10 minutes from the um, appellant We'd like to try to cap the um, applicant's time to 10 minutes and then the rebuttal from the applicant from the, excuse me, the applicant will now have 10 minutes. The rebuttal will be uh, five minutes. And then, like I said, we're following a um, very specified public hearing process. So I want to thank everyone in advance for um, uh, honoring that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So I'd like to invite Aaron to, okay. Aaron, give me one sec to bring up your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Honorable Council Members, and Mayor Hollister, Thomas James Holmes, applicant. Also joining me on Zoom is our architect, Jamie Mathern of Dawn. And I think she may need to be promoted if she's not already. So she's gonna be presenting part of this. Uh, Kristen, give you a great overview of the project and uh, we agree with the, with the staff's uh, recommendation and their uh, analysis. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump into my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the context that we do see is, is largely single family. Uh, we are proposing two stories. There are some two stories in the neighborhood and we do see single story, a lot of those as well. But what we think we've done with our home is by complying with the guidelines in the zoning, I think we've sculpted it to a place where we think it's contextual. So if you can go to the next slide, this is the area of plan that you have already seen. And we looking at the appellant's property to the north, I think we have a good setback at this uh, location here, about 78 feet from the primary residence and 64 feet from that um, accessory building at the rear. And then if you go to the next slide, um, just to show you, we was not in our intention to uh, omit that accessory building. Um, when we were first taking a look at this property, we did not see that it was nested underneath that tree cover, as you can see on the right. Um, the new aerial that became available to us in 2023, you can clearly see that it's there it's after some point was removed. Uh, when we did engage with the appellant um, in October and November of last year, we did learn that that building was back there. However, we didn't get a follow-up. Uh, com uh, we, did, we did offer to survey that property to uh, get the exact location on the accessory building. However, we didn't hear back on the offer. So. Uh, that's why we're getting the correction out because we have a pretty good idea for the building that finds the, uh, the tree coverage. So next slide, please. Uh, this shows our site plan. And just to show you how we uh, took a look at our site planning, uh, what we did is on the left, that's existing, right, is what we're proposing. What we wanted to do is you, uh, reuse the flat area of the lot as much as we could, uh, not as disturbed, not disturbed. Uh, further area than what we needed. Also, largely we're using more the drive-in location is located. Uh, if you can see on the site plan, the dark area is the second floor. We have sculpted that in the sides. And then um, as the opponent has mentioned, uh, the two-story goes back to 20 feet, 10 inches of the rear property line. On the side closest to the appellants, we are 35 feet, 10 inches back there. So what we wanted to do was carve out a little open space on that side. Um, so there's just more room recognizing the context on the left and then the context at the rear. So that's what we did. Um, also wanted to preserve the trees at the rear of the property. Uh, we, we do have, um, as I uh, mentioned, she does have the, the large uh, fig on her side. 
and we recognize that. Plus, what I'm going to show you next uh, our landscaping plan. We can provide a little more green buffer between the two. So, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is our landscaping plan. The light green circles represent new tree plantings. Uh, we uh, we do have a number of heritage trees on both sides on adjacent properties. All of those are to be preserved to provide additional privacy screening. Uh, dark circles at the rear. They're they're not meant to show exactly the, the screening at the rear, but those do show approximate locations of existing trees at the rear that we're hoping uh, will help prevent that buffer. Uh, we did look at providing additional tree plantings in the rear. However, the new tree plantings would compete with the what's out there already, and there would be effects at the long-term health of adjacent trees and the trees on our site. Uh, additionally, we did look at other um, hedge plantings that we could potentially do. We are limited to about seven feet in height, I believe, if Chris can confirm that with our uh, property line planting. So we really weren't able to do anything higher at the rear than seven feet. So those are some considerations with that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, you've seen these elevations. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out on the rear elevation, we do have um, at the part that comes back for this 20 feet 10 uh, inches from the rear property line, where that massing is 18 feet 2 inches. So it's not like we're taking up the whole width of the line. It's just that one area. And the, to the top of the plate height from the bones grade, we're about 20 and a half feet. And then to the tallest ridge line in that, and that mass of about 23 and a half feet. And if you go to the next slide, you can see on the far right hand side that ridge, it, there's a gentle slope off of the head roof. So that also helps reduce the massing at the rear and uh, sunlight preservation. Uh, the related, related to privacy, we did pull all window sills up on the second floor, three and a half feet. Uh, from the finished floor, which is um, what commission and staff typically like to see, are only windows that are three feet above finished floor are um, required egress windows for their bedrooms. Basically, next slide. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to our architect who prepared our solar analysis, and uh, Jamie, you can take it away. Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> Good evening, council members. I'm Jamie Matheron, a principal and senior architect at Dolan Architecture and Planning. And um, we've designed this home and then we've recently added this solar study uh, to the project to help you understand the implications of any shadows that may be cast on any neighboring properties. So we went into detail here on the existing condition of the existing home, as well as the proposed condition um, at four different times throughout the year. So just in a general sense here on this cover sheet for the solar study, we're showing you this, the solar conditions for the date closest to us right now, which would be the March 19th um, condition. In the table on the left, we're showing that when we look at those four different times throughout the year, um, the spring, summer, fall, and winter, we're showing any amount of the neighboring uh, properties that would have a, a shadow cast by the proposed home. So on from the appellant's property at 883 Middle, on December 21st, there are two times um, where there is some shadow cast, but none of the other times throughout the year uh, is there any shadow cast on 883 Middle. We also looked at 444 University, the home to the left of us, and there are some times throughout the year where there are subtle amounts of shadows that are cast on that home. And as you'll see as we go through, <clears throat> those shadows are actually very similar to the shadows that 444 casts on its neighbor to the left, uh, 895 middle. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So we can look here at um, the existing, this is the existing home at 440, so that's the existing one-story home. Uh, we are showing the green circles are the existing tall trees that are about 60 feet tall that are at the rear of 883. So of course, those are going to cast shadows as well. Um, so some of that concern of shadowing on the, the rear of that 883 property um, could also be considered in context with those existing very tall trees that are there. So the only times um, in the existing home, there's a couple of times where there's a small shadow cast on 444, which you see highlighted in blue. Additionally, the fence, the privacy fences, you can start to see 
also cast shadows. So those are about six feet tall. So we've highlighted any shadow that goes past the existing shadows of the privacy fence. So that's why the whole portion of shadow is not highlighted because the fence is already there and the fence in, in any condition with any home there, the fence would be casting a shadow. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. All right, so this is also the existing home and now we are into the autumn and winter seasons. And so we can see, of course, in that time of year, the shadows get a bit longer. Um, so there is a bit more shadowing on 444 from uh, the existing home in the really just in the winter conditions. And let's go now to the next slide. So we see here um, the proposed home. And so we've added below the date and time, we've added the amount that would be shaded, the amount of the uh, neighboring property that would be shaded. And we can take a look there, like at the spring equinox, March 19th, 9 a.m., you can see that some of that 444 property is shaded, but actually none of their roof is even shaded. So that shadow is being cast by the home onto the ground and maybe a little bit onto the sidewall, but there, you know, that is a two-story home as well. So none of the um, shadow from 440 is being cast on the roof of 444. So if they had solar panels, that wouldn't cause any issue for them. Um, and you can see the, the same kind of shadow that 444 is casting on uh, its neighbor to the left. So we have um, the 9 a.m. spring and summer, there's a little bit of shadow cast on 444 and then at the other times. Now let's go to the last page. So now we're into the autumn and winter. So again, as we talked about before, there's much longer shadows, especially in the winter, especially December 21st timeframe. Um, so here is where um, there are two times of the year where there are shadows cast on 883 middle. And so that would be um, the winter solstice, December 21st at noon. There's a very tiny amount of shadow uh, into the backyard that's over the fence line shadow. You can see like the structure that's right up to the property line of 444 is casting a shadow um, onto 883, um, but that accessory structure is built right up to that property line. Of course, as Aaron talked about, our proposed home is about 20 feet farther, uh, you know, 20 feet set back from the property line, complying with all those setbacks. And then if we look at the 3 p.m. time, and of course, you know, in December 21st at 3 p.m., it's getting almost getting dark. And so that's this is the time where there's the most significant shadow that would be cast by the proposed home into um, the rear of that property of 883. And again, you can see 444 is casting a shadow and which would be fairly similar in scale and size um, as the shadow that would be cast by the new proposed home. So that's an overview of the shadows. I'll hand it back to Aaron and I can be available for any further questions that you may have. Thank you, Jamie. Can you just give a quick overview of how we uh, did the modeling? Uh, the oh, yeah. Thank you for that reminder. Yes, thanks, Aaron. So um, we start with a site survey that is created by a professional civil engineer, and then we input that into a professional 3D modeling program. And that we can plug in any date and time throughout the year, and it creates the shadow for us. So this is not us drawing out shadows that we want to see. This is a professional program um, that creates these shadows. And so then that is, uh, we've, you know, taken snapshots of that and put the, you know, compiled these all together into this kind of document. So we've modeled the homes in the exact size that they are, um, you know, with the proposed home, the neighboring homes to the right heights. That's where you see um, in the case I talked about earlier, where the shadows are cast on the ground, but not on the roof. That is because the there's a 3D model created here where the home has the correct height. And so the shadows are being reflected accurately uh, when they're cast on the ground as opposed to cast, cast on the walls or cast on the roof. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, yeah, I think we can wrap it up really quickly here. I think we're running up on our time, but um, just go to the next slide really quick. Uh, we just, uh, for the floor plans, I know there was a concern raised about the ADU and not having a separate entrance. It does have a separate entrance uh, from the porch, and there is a double locking door from the inside per the uh, city's code. And then, um, if you spell the next slide, uh, you did hear we did have our neighborhood meeting back in October of last year, and then we did have follow up uh, with two neighbors from November, including the appellant. Um, and now we're here this evening, and then uh, I think. If you go to the next slide, I can uh, finish uh, with my presentation and say thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your consideration. 
I would like to emphasize we are not asking for any variances. Everything we do, we do are doing complies with the code. We're not removing any heritage trees. It's a code compliant project, and we hope that you can see that that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so at this time, um, we have heard from the um, appellant, we've heard from the applicant, and now this is the opportunity for our uh, appellant to um, do a rebuttal for five minutes. So please, um, Ms. Hoff, the floor is yours. And you are muted, thank you. Great. Um, hi. I um, I have taken notes. The first thing I want to say is that uh, they did not reach out to me at all. Uh, I don't know why they said they did, but they categorically, when they said they didn't hear back from me, they categorically didn't. Um, it was not wholly approved by the PC. Two members actually abstained. What I'm concerned about is future development in my backyard. Um, the fact that they showed solar studies with the existing property in literally half of the solar studies are there exist the existing property is completely irrelevant. Um, and I can tell you that 444 does not cast shadows onto my property. So another thing to look at is at, on this slide. Um, holy from 1230 to approximately 7 p.m., uh, that house cast shadow onto my property. I'm concerned about future development and back. Most importantly, it casts the most shadow in the dead of winter, throwing my house into darkness and future development into darkness. Um, the, you know, the thing about plans is that they're only two dimensional. It doesn't show, you know, the impacts of how high this house is going to be. And again, I'm imploring the city council to do, um, the stick thing where they put up wood and it shows you how big the house is going to be. I think that, um, Let's see, I'm looking at my scribbled notes um, that, you know, this is an out of town developer. They are never going to live in that house. They are never going to be a good neighbor. They are never going to be part of this neighborhood. They are an out of town developer who buys houses, tears them down and puts up McMansions and really truly disregards the simple things that um, at least I am asking for that are also within code. Move the house as close to the front of the property as possible. It can move almost three feet. That would help mitigate impacts. Um, the fact that they said they reached out, the fact that they've they've showed the old house in the solar plan is indicative of the modus operandi of developers. Um, Let's see. And it can completely block the sun for about five hours. Um, uh, existing versus second floor. If they could just move the back, the primary bedroom back a few feet. And when I mean back, I mean back toward the, the street or forward to the street. Um, they have a setback at the front of the house for the second story. Why can't they take that to the back of the house? The front of the house setback doesn't impact anyone. The back of the house setback would be so much nicer for me. Um, I'm, I also have concerns about the light pollution of their outdoor room. Um, and uh, I, I, that's all. I feel like I'm about running out of time, but again, I, I implore the um, developer to take into consideration these things and come up with a plan that is not so intrusive on my house, my yard, my plants, my trees, my quality of life. And, um, and to look at the houses nearby that have larger, larger backyard setbacks. And while 20 feet, 10 inches may be in code, and while 28 feet tall may be in code, 
The fact is the city council has the authority and the autonomy and the discretion to ask the developer to do better, to be a better neighbor, to um, take into consideration the impacts on the neighbors. And, um, and I'm asking the city council to do that. Thank you very much. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you uh, very much to both the appellant and our applicant this evening. Um, now, I would like to ask city council members if they have any clarifying questions. I can't hear you. Oh, dear. Opening the public uh, council member Combs. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is for city staff. The lot is substandard, I think you said, uh, by width and area. What's the specifics on, on how much it is substandard width and how much the parcel area is, is uh, this square footage is, is substandard? Uh, right, so uh, this is an R1U zoning district where the minimum lot dimensions are 65 by 100 uh, with a minimum lot area of 7,000 square feet. Um, this particular lot is 52 feet wide um, and then 5,200 square feet, so 52 by 100. And, and do we have any um, knowledge or understanding? It's hard to hear you. Can you speak to the microphone? Oh, okay. Sorry. Sure. You need to turn it on. Oh, I do. Yeah, so it, it should have a red kind of line, and then when you push that button, it turns green. Push it. Now let go. Push it. You're too strong. Okay. Okay. Does this work better? Thank you. Judy told me not to use the microphone, so uh, <laughs> that's um, okay. So uh, thanks for for that. Um, do you, for some of the neighboring parcels, do we have an understanding of whether they are substandard or not? Um, or is is it mostly we're looking at this block? Um, is it is it mostly substandard lots? Is or are they mostly standard lots? Um, just looking at like the area plan and then GIS, it looks like most of the surrounding properties are just substandard in one way or another. Um, the adjacent properties to the left all look to be about the same size as the subject property. So I'm assuming they're also substandard in different area. Um, and this is how it's um, parsed with enough as substandard to know. I'm uh, pulling out my GIS, but it, it looks like it's probably substandard in width. We have enough yeah. uh, depth in the area. Okay. Thanks. And then my last question is: Is do we uh, do we know why two planning commissioners abstained? Is is I, did, I didn't watch this. Um, read, like if it's, did they provide any explanation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Commissioner um, <coughs> Lawrence, before he. Um, Mentioned his abstaining, did mention that prior meeting we talked about SB9 and some discussion about um, you know design guidelines and design standards, uh, particularly for SB9 and this um, project is sort of exactly why uh, they would like to see those design guidelines. Um, that was the reason we gave uh, Commissioner Kate and one of the other. Um, and so, so just, just, just so I can, this might have to say last one. Um, so Commissioner Barnes said that he was abstaining because this, he would like to see design guidelines, right? And so in, in some way like this, what would the design guidelines have done to this project that he would have preferred that led him to abstain? Um, so I don't want to hurt. Yeah, it's in the barns, but um, it sounded like the intent was you know, if the city were to develop design and standards, design guidelines, um, the sort of, yes, um, you know, dispute on um, the particular design of the house would happen because, in theory, the design guidelines would create a situation where we have better setbacks or like better understanding the interaction. Um, we 
if we and just so I'm not these are my words, not yours. And so that would lead him to penalize the applicant by by not participating in the vote. It seems though where we're sort of netting out. Which yeah, I don't, I don't want to throw words. I think it was more of um, we didn't want to vote on a single family house project given that we don't have design guidelines. Um, and it was something we went into a lot of detail with previously. So, like, I actually reached out to Mr. Barnes and to ask him exactly why he did abstain. And he said it was not because of this project, it was because of a more global concern about um, how we treat single family homes with use permits versus where we're going with the SB9. And I think that that's exactly what I was extrapolating. I appreciate that. I, I'll just, because it's out there, say publicly, I find that incredibly problematic that you would penalize an applicant. Um, uh, because they have to go through an additional process that you don't think that they should have to go through. I'm, I'm sure that they don't want to go through that additional process, but they also would want your vote, right? And so, um, but, but thank you for that additional explanation. Are there any more clarifying questions from my colleagues before we open the public hearing? Please. So, in the staff report, it says the location, this is on um, page G1.2, um, letter B. I'm wondering what it means when it states the location of the proposed second story would not cause any unique impacts to solar access. What the word unique caught my eye. Yeah, so generally with any two-story project or one-story project, there are going to be increased um, impacts, all the shadows, et cetera. Um, that's true of any two-story two-story projects. Um, so why we do have they like planes, high restriction, et cetera. Um, this particular project doesn't have any features. I think this how so the next door had a spire or something like that. Um, were cast, you know, a different or more excessive shadow than sort of your typical single gun. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions? All right, then. Thank you, Mr. Turner. So at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. Uh, City Clerk Heron, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Wollison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our public hearing item G1, consider an appeal of the Planning Commission approval of a use permit to demolish an existing single-story, single-family residence and construct a new two-story residence with an attached garage on a substandard lot at 440 University Drive. If participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. All right, and our first speaker will be Jenny Michelle. Good evening, um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, um, staff, um, other council members, neighbors, members of the public. My name is Jenny Michelle from the Coleman Place Neighborhood Block. Also, Judy Heron, fan club member, longtime renting resident on Willow Road, recovering homeless teacher, mom of IEP student at Laurel, and a commercial property manager. I think this has been a healthy conversation. However, I wish the applicant was specking a dwelling that would house four to eight families, not just one family or one couple. If we're going to have this intrusive conversation, as neighbors have mentioned, I wish it was in the furtherance of stabilizing labor in the local area to help bring health to neighbors by housing us and investing in us. Right now, it's clear that your 
somewhat taken advantage of us and our high land value. And honestly, it's gross. And I call you out. It would be so much more productive to have this conversation over density and meeting the needs of the city and our state obligations for housing production, housing preservation, and securing labor in a way away from displacement. So I challenge the applicant to do better. We've seen you come before this dais before uh, on several occasions. And I request that you amend your assumptions of what the market, the residents, the leveraged workforce can bear here. And I dare you to build density. I dare you to invest in us, not just for your bottom line. And so in that sense, we see you and I call you out. Do better. Uh, just do it. Otherwise, expletive. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. This will be the final call for public comment on our public hearing item G1. Seeing no hands or cards. Mayor Willison, please continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So with the conclusion of public comment, I will now close the public hearing and open it up for city council discussion. Um, is there any discussion on this item? Or a motion? City council member comes. Yep. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just sort of go out here and just test the word. I'm just looking at my notes. Um, but first of all, Ms. Michelle, thank you for your, your comment. Um, your comments always reveal my bias because you allow me to look at something in a way I never thought to look at it before. And so, so I de definitely appreciate, appreciate that. Um, um, and appreciate that, Ms. Howe, you bringing, bringing this, um, this appeal. And I appreciate you framing it in a way of, of what the council has the ability to do. And, and I, I do think that that's an appropriate in, in frame, uh, appropriate call out. But in our ability, our discretion of doing something, there should be some logic behind it. And, and I think some, some logic that references how we've, and how the city in a general sense approaches these matters. And so I don't know if, if something is fitting with all, within all of the guidelines, um, um, we're not asking for a variance. It's, it's fitting within all of the setbacks. I don't know what I'm going to position then the requirement that they move closer to the street or that they step in the second story more. And, and I mean, I don't, I, I don't know what I'm, I'm basing that on um, other than, than your preference, which I, I think is, is, is valid. It, it is, but, but I don't know if, if, if that's enough um, for me to sort of look at this differently. And, um, and so, um, and, and so I think that that's what I'm struggling with at, at the moment. If, if someone can help me to see it more, um, as you're seeing it, Ms. Howe, then I'm, I'm, I'm totally open to that. But as I see here now, again, again, not a variance within the setback, and, and, and I don't know that we have like, like what if we're moving the project, then like what, what, you know, what if we're forcing them to move it, what we're basing it on. And from my, my years on the planning commission, I know that it's it's always never just that simple. <laughs> like, right, you, you move something um, uh, two feet, you, you, two feet, a structure like this, there are additional ripple impacts and effects of which you don't know. And, and then you, you, you open up a can of worms, which is what we'd always say from the planning commission. If you try to redesign it from the dais, there are things that are gonna come to play that you just don't know, and which makes it always a, a really sort of challenging uh, ordeal. I do think it, it is important to point out though that with this ADU unit, it's really not an ADU unit. It's just like using ADU to get additional square footage. And 
And, and that is exactly what, what is happening here. And, and they can do it and, and it, it's totally fine. But I do think it is worth calling out that that this is going to be, I don't know, whatever, a $4 million house or something like that. And that room is not going to get rented out. It's most likely going to get used a, a, as an office. And, and I say that to us to sort of think of like, when we hear in these policy positions are sort of saying, oh, look, here's the solution. You know, we're going to do this. We're going to say, you, have to, you know, we're going to make it more liberal for you to put in an ADU. Um, I, I think we get situations like this where it's just the ADU is used as a way to, to sort of have a bigger house. Um, and, and that's what's happening here. But again, um, to Ms. Mrs. House um, um, ask here, I, I just don't know how I get there. But if, if someone, one of my colleagues wants to help me, then I, I, I may be willing to go on that journey. Thank you, Council Member Combs. Uh, Council Member Nash. So I actually came down in exactly the same spot. Um, this is a project which, um, while I'm empathize with the neighbor um, and her fruit trees, it, they are not um, asking for any variances. They are not taking down any, any heritage trees. Um, and the other neighbors around seem to think that this will um, it, we're not hearing from any other neighbors negative comments. So I am um, also not um, able to find anything to make the changes um, that Ms. House is asking for, um, although I certainly hear what she's saying. And um, it is part of living in our, in our beautiful city. Um, I guess one other comment is, um, if I read correctly on the um, staff report, um, it's actually not possible to just move the, um, the house up two feet because they're actually, because of the porch, um, they're actually, I believe it's only two inches from the setback line. And so in addition to the other um, issues that you raised, which I think are very valid, are, um, there's also the, um, issue that it's it's would create yet another problem with the side Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. So I have a question. Um, as a advocate of residents in Menlo Park, the appellant stated that you did not reach out to them. So I would, if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, so we had our, we reached out to all uh, neighbors. Thanks, Vice Mayor, for the question too. We reached out to all neighbors within 300 feet of our site uh, prior to our neighborhood meeting in October. Um, the appellant was one of them. The appellant did attend the neighborhood meeting. There were uh, follow up phone calls and emails um, after that meeting for about the next month. And then about November 3rd was when the correspondence uh, ceased because we learned that there probably wouldn't be a middle ground. Um, we thought we were. Developing something that was within code that was potentially supportable. And um, the appellant said that she would oppose our, our project because she didn't agree with it. So that's that's where things left out. Thank you. I appreciate you addressing that. And then and one other question, just because you're popular in Mount Park, um, what number of houses is this for you? I don't have that exact number on the top of my head, but I can find it out it's probably tomorrow. So Thank you. Know, like, Four dozen, three dozen? No, I I don't think it's three dozen. I would say it's under 30 for sure. But I could get that exactly. Thank you. Yes. Um, any other comments, Vice Mayor Taylor? Okay. Uh, Councilman Bedore, should, you don't. I just uh, want to say that I appreciate what uh, my fellow council members, Nash and Combs, shared today about you know understanding what is um, what we have discretion over and what is um, really our role to do um, at the council and you know in alignment with the codes that the council's already set. Uh, some of this also brings up for me in thinking about um, what is required for substandard lots to go through in order to uh, be able to do uh, changes on those lots. Um, especially, you know, given that it sounds like a lot of the, the houses right next door and in this neighborhood are substandard. And I think is it one half of all Menlo Park homes on substandard lots. I, I love a confirmation of that. But uh, just so many houses uh, have to go through the special permit process. 
And um, this the conversation makes me all the more interested and excited to think about effective standards uh, to improve the process. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Um, so I believe everything's been said that I would say. Um, so I do want to um, uh, thank the applicant and the appellant. Um, and uh, I believe with that, is there a motion that someone would like to make? I'm happy to make a motion. Okay, so um, Council Member Dorr is making a motion. Is there a second? And um, Council Member Nash is seconding. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Doer, a second by City Council Member Nash, to adopt a resolution denying the appeal and upholding the Planning Commission's approval of a use permit to demolish an existing one-story single-family residence and construct a new two-story residence with an attached garage and a substandard lot with regard to minimum lot width and area in the R1U zoning district, lo district located at 440 University Drive. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Doer? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Wollison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heron. We are now moving on to H, regular business. Under regular business, the City Council considers recommendations from the city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require city council approval. The first regular business item is H1, provide direction on the proposed programming plan elements for the Menlo Park Community Campus. And to introduce this item, we have a few of our staff members here. I see Library and Community Services Director, Sean Reinhardt. Interim Assistant Community Services Director Rondell Howard and Library and Community Services Supervisor Natalia Jones. Welcome. Please. One moment to bring up the presentation. I heard the instructions earlier, so let me see if I can. <laughs> Not too hard. Sounds pretty good. Hey, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. Uh, thank you for hearing this time. It's been a very exciting Senate for you. I'll take the introduction because the mayor very kindly made up earlier. Let me um, stop the review. We'll just launch into the presentation. We do have a fair amount of material in here. We'll try to be first, but it's an important topic, so we do want to cover it all while we're not simple. Um, so let me proceed to the next slide. So um, the recommendation uh, tonight really is for city council to provide guidance and input on the following considerations of any others of the, that may come along for the city council tonight. Uh, first is do the proposed programming path plan elements shown in the report have been walk through those align with city council's vision and expectations for the Menlo Park community campus. Are there additional elements that city council would like contributed or changed in the plan? Do the statements about who the new facility will serve and how the programs and services will be prioritized to those meet city council's expectations for the new facility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just some shots here is an aerial of the site when it was first cleared. This is at 100 Terminal Avenue. Uh, next slide. Showing the progression as the building's frame went up. And then next slide. Uh, this was few months back, it's progressed quite a bit, even since then, the, the swimming pool has been built and you see going forward and for it. Um, so anyway, the building's rising before our eyes. It's incredibly exciting for the community at the landmark that will serve for uh, generations to come. Next slide, please. So um, who the MPCC will serve? Um, everything we're seeing tonight is really the result of several months of discussions with community members, with the city council, with the MPCC subcommittee through a community survey. And it's kind of arrived at this point where we really want to just identify who this facility will serve. And it will reflect and prioritize the people for whom it's being created. That's Menlo Park residents, specifically Bellhaven neighborhood residents, and in particular, longtime Bellhaven residents who relied heavily on the services in the previous center. 
Additionally, the new facility can and should serve these residents even more meaningfully and with even greater priority and with even more responsiveness, inclusion, and belonging than existed in the previous center. That's how we kind of understand the vision for who this facility is intended to serve. Next slide, please. And I just want to remind the city council will call your attention to this statement, which is primarily pulled from the city's cost recovery policy, which the city council updated last year um, about um, the fair, just, and equitable management of all institutions serving the public directly or by contract, about the fair, just, and equitable distribution of public services and implementation of public policy, so and the commitment to promote inclusion, fairness, justice, and equity in the formation of public policy. This is kind of part of our policies. And we are bringing that to bear as we uh, develop the programming plan for this new project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, wouldn't be a presentation about the project without some of these beautiful renderings. So those are going to be interspersed throughout. And I believe at this point, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Natalia Jones. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so we we did a community survey and we came up with the results. Um, just a little bit of information about the survey. Um, it was sent out to all of residents that participate in recreation and community programs. It was developed with input from the NPCC committee, subcommittee and the working group, as well as the Parks and Rec Commission. So, okay, there it is. So it was developed with input from the MPCC subcommittee and working group, the Parks and Rec Commission, the Library Commission, and the City Council. The survey opened on June 13th and stayed open for about two months. Uh, it was distributed in paper and electronic format, and it was sent out in both English and Spanish, and we received over 900 responses. And then on September 13th, there was a presentation that was given to the city council with the completed survey results. Next slide. So some programming considerations based on the community survey. Um, so the elements were prioritized based on what the respondents thought was most important. So wanting to include programs that aren't currently offered, um, but were rated in 40, so such as homework help for children and teens after school, job skills or training for job readiness, advice and support for food insecurity, support for health care, and then just general social services. The next slide, please. So continuing, um, one in the prioritized programs and classes that are free or have discounted fees for Menlo Park residents, um, making sure that we are not prioritizing programs that would bring participants that work from Menlo Park. We wanna make sure that the programs that we offer are what the neighborhood is requesting, having casual and drop-in play opportunities for children and families in Menlo Park, and then the aquatics program, those are being addressed in a different agreement with the aquatics operator. Next slide. And so the MPCC subcommittee and working group, what it is, it was created by the city council and it's to work with the city staff as well as the community on the MPCC project. Both Vice Mayor Taylor and city council member Nash are both part of that group. Um, the committee is with, it's a group of Menlo Park residents and they advise the subcommittee's work and the city staff, as well as the committee, have been working together over the past several months. We meet over the past several months. Next slide. And the general vision for the MPP, MPCC facility, based on the working group, to have a new, a different, and a fresh approach for the facility, to put preference on residents, businesses, and staff, that may have been displaced during the transition um, to give them priori priority in coming back. Um, to start, what we did is start with 
reviewing what the current or the prior community center offered, and then also looking at other community centers in surrounded areas and seeing what they offered, making sure that outreach included individuals that either lacked technology skills or didn't have regular access to skills, also the Spanish speakers, and then making sure to recognize people in the community that have rec that have created the vision of the MPCC facility. Next slide. And so some of the proposed operational and policy elements at the new facility is making sure that the front desk has information, city information, resources that individuals can look out for, that the staff has some type of medical training, CPR, that there is an attendant that can go and make sure that the athletic facilities are kept clean and sanitary, making sure that um, there are roles and rules for the public spaces that are shared, such as supervision of children or what's an appropriate noise level, giving priority to Kelly Field and the tennis courts to, to the neighborhood, um, ensuring that there are fee structures and scholarships so that everyone that wants to use the facility will be able to use the facility and just focusing on the Mellow Park residents and the Bayfront community as people that will um, use the program or use the facility and not bringing it out to others. Next slide. And then here's another <coughs> visualization of the new facility. Next slide. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? All right, perfect. So um, I'll just kind of go over these uh, proposed programming kind of plan elements uh, for each one of the entities within the building. So first is our, our library and makerspace. Um, and one of the things we want to stress about is that uh, that the residents in Menlo Park, especially Bellhaven residents, um, will have priority access, right, to the popular, updated, diverse, educational, inspiring, resourceful, useful, um, entertaining, and all these healthy and uh, helpful library materials. Um, again, we will focus and reflect on the interests and needs of the Menlo Park community, especially in the Bellhaven neighborhood. Um, so that includes things such as updating browsing collections, story time, technology access, and so forth. Next, please. Excuse me. Um, also within that entity, uh, we also want to elaborate on some, some after-school homework support, um, librarian uh, uh, help hours, um, and then including a, a new team space, um, some maker space uh, with large tables for like 3D printer but as well to support pottery classing, uh, sewing classes, wood carving, things of that nature. Uh, next slide. Um, our next entity, our proposed programming plan will be for our aquatic center. Um, and again, it will be focused and uh, we will prioritize the needs of the Menlo Park residents and then especially uh, eyeing in on the Bellhaven neighborhood residents. Um, the MPCC will, or the new facility will have uh, the same quality and variety of programs as, as we do over at Burgess, at the Burgess Pool. Um, and then fees shall not create barriers um, to access for Menlo, for Menlo Park residents, again, especially our Bellhaven residents. So uh, just, just noting that, that programs will be offered to residents with little to no resident uh, participation fees and discounted rates uh, that, that will ensure that that will not ensure that uh, that will prevent access to our uh, residents. Next slide, please. Um, other things that will that will kind of come into that uh, when we think about our aquatic center is uh, senior pool access, uh, exercising, um, inclusion of infant and toddler age appropriate activities for all, and then um, implementing the city council's direction for aquatics program that was in the recent uh, RFP. Next slide, please. Um, next proposed programming is for our athletic facilities. Um, that includes our gymnasium, our fitness center, uh, movement studios, and, and, and again, it's to prioritize our Menlo, our Menlo Park residents, but eyeing in on our uh, Bellhaven residents as well. Um, again, these programs, just as the other programs, will be equivalent or same as the, uh, the recreation center and the gymnasium. Uh, over on the Burgess, Burgess campus, which is our uh, Ariaga facilities. 
Um, and again, uh, and you'll hear me say this a couple of times, but making sure that uh, the fee structure is offered to the residents with uh, kind of to little to no, no fees. So we, so we can ensure that there's no barriers to prevent access for our residents. Next slide, please. Um, some of the some of the uh, features that that we're proposing um, is strength training for women, uh, gymnastic classes for kids with special needs. Uh, if you look at it, we can say our uh, team fitness uh, offering inclusion of teams with disabilities, um, and then also having a, a new fitness center, safe, state of the art uh, equipment, rooming. As everyone knows, the last our last facility was not that big, so um, having some space. And then also having a movement studio um, to that that focuses on functional exercises with cardio when you think of a Zumba, step classes, things of that nature. So next slide, please. <clears throat> and then uh, next is educational opportunities. Um, again, as <laughs> as I go over these these uh, different entities, is prioritizing our Miller Park uh, residents, our Fellhaven neighborhood residents. Um, making sure that that the programs are the same and equivalent to what's happening now on our Burgess campus. And then again, making sure that fees are not creating barriers for our, uh, for our residents at all. Next slide, please. Um, educational opportunities that's continued. We're thinking of coding, engineering, um, health and nutrition classes for all, um, basic life skills. So you think about budgeting, how to manage money, um, job seeking that includes resumes. Uh, interview skills, college programming, computer labs, so on. Next slide, please. Um, other educational opportunities that are uh, uh, that we can that we can base our um, our programs on, or the elements on, is so uh, our bike repair station, our classes. Um, an example of that is our Live in Peace organization, a uh, collaboration that we have that happens here now at the Bellhaven Branch Library. Um, so continuing something like that, or enhancing it. Uh, some cooking classes, teaching, uh, teaching gardening, and then adaptive recreation classes. And when you think of that, you think of mixed media art, karate, some cooking, dancing, fitness, things of that nature. Next slide, please. Um, proposed programming elements for our facility rentals. Um, so first and foremost, again, is to prioritize not just our residents, but local nonprofit uh, organizations as well to have access to be able to rent the facility when we do open. Um, and those facilities are those those entities are would would involve uh, our event hall, flexible classrooms, conference room, makerspace, gymnasium, and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, instructional classes. Uh, again, these classes are to meet the needs of the Miller Park residents, especially our Bell Haven uh, neighborhood residents. Again, making sure that these instructional classes. Our equivalent are the same to what's happening now on our Burgess campus, on our Burgess campus, and in and around the city of Miller Park. And, and fees are making sure that the fees are not setting barriers. Next slide. Um, these instructional classes include youth classes, adult classes, and when you think of youth classes, you think of STEM pro, uh, STEM education, enrichment classes, electives, things of those natures. Um, and then adult classes, we're thinking about health and fitness, dance. Um, arts and crafts, tennis and pickleball lessons as well. Can't forget pickleball. <laughs> um, proposed, proposed programming for our senior program. So uh, when we think of our senior our senior center right now, we're thinking of, uh, we're proposing our, our just putting our, our uh, eggs in a bucket to have like the nutrition programs, um, some door-to-door -door accessible transportation, um, makerspace. Um, and when you think of our makerspace, you think of uh, our seniors, some traditional arts and crafts, some pottery, uh, sewing, um, uh, painting, things of those natures. Uh, and then also including the, the kiln that's that's already, that we already have. Um, definitely wanna think about technology access and support for our seniors. Next slide, please. Um, we also have some, um, we're thinking of dance, yoga, some meditation, mind exercise, and some social <laughs> events, as you all know, uh, our senior, program hosts uh, some really, really good social events for, for our community. Um, and then also just providing a, ride, a, a variety of support for our seniors through collaborations. Um, right now we have Second Harvest, Food Bank, Foothill College, Peninsula Volunteers, 
but uh, being with the new center uh, is definitely a way to enhance and even build on new collaborations with other local organizations. Um, and also uh, social services for health and wellness support and referrals. Next slide. Um, getting down to our youth center, uh, again, after school youth development programs, summer programs, uh, neighborhood-based school priority access, uh, transportation for, uh, for our students, and then also a safe and healthy learning environment. So parents who do allow their kids to come visit us, our hangout and our uh, programs, knowing that their kids are safe and having a fun time. Next slide, please. Um, some of these daily, uh, some of these programs would, would include daily enrichment activities that consist of arts and crafts, um, kind of sports program, homework assisting, team building, socializing, uh, weekly enrichment activities. When we think of that, that's more of our summer activities, but swimming, water play, field trips, things of that nature. Um, and then synergy with, uh, with the classes that's being offered within the new facility. So a way that we can support um, our instructors that's within our facilities that's running classes, we'll have a way to escort the kids to these different programs while still being within uh, being within our pro after school program, our summer camps. So that can include, again, collaborations with the library as far as homework tutoring, um, Spanish instruction classes, swimming lessons at the new pool and other programs that's offered within the new facility. Next slide. <laughs> and here's another picture of, uh, I think this is right outside our senior center, um, kind of the patio area. So a nice area where, where folks can hang out. Um, this is an evening, it's kind of getting dark. So this is kind of that, that area, but then I'll continue to the next slide and pass it over back to Sean. Thanks. Thank you, Adele and Natalia. A lot of material there. A lot's going to be going on in this building. Thank you for the time for us to kind of walk through sort of where we are in the planning process. Um, really looking forward to getting to the public comment as well as the council feedback. Just a few other things quickly, and we'll wrap up the presentation portion. Just wanted to note and thank the work of the Menlo Park Community Campus Subcommittee and the working group of residents. Uh, as you know, City Council created that subcommittee. It's currently Vice Mayor Taylor and City Council Member Nash to work with the staff and the community on this project. Um, the subcommittee created a working group of Menlo Park residents. I think they were almost all Bellhaven residents, actually, to support and advise that work. We've met many times over the past several months. A number of the working group members are actually here in the audience. You just raise your hand if you're part of the working group. I can go on to three, four of you. Thank you so much for putting in the time. We hope that this kind of reflects everything we've talked about. Um, and so we just want to really thank you for putting in the time to help advise this incredibly important project for our community. Uh, next slide. I think we're moving on just to some timeline information just to put this discussion in context. Tonight, we're presenting the proposed elements of the programming plan to the city council just to kind of get that feedback before we move into filling out all the details. Um, on April 26th, we're planning another joint meeting of the Parks and Recreation and Library Commissions here in this library to really dive in on those elements of facilities, policies, as well as what that neighborhood and resident prioritization policy might look like, as well as anything else that the city council may direct tonight. On May 9th, coming back to the city council with an informational update with some details around preliminary staffing operations and related programming considerations to actually make this happen. May 15th, uh, the two the two commissions will kind of break apart in May again and kind of tackle their subject areas in a little more detail. Library Commission really drilling in on the public library, the youth center, the makerspace, teen zone, senior center, and social services. Uh, looking at the details of that plan. May 24th, the Parks and Recreation Commission would tackle the details of the gymnasium, aquatic center, rec programs, facility rentals, athletic field, outdoor racket sports, which would include, of course, pickleball. June 1st is the City Council's budget workshop for fiscal year 24. That would include the initial budget proposals for staffing, programming, and operations in the MPCC facility. So that's when we expect to have an actual detailed budget and staffing proposal out there for the public and the City Council to view um, just a couple months from now. June 13th, of course, is the City Council's uh, public hearing for the budget. And then June 27th is the targeted adoption of the budget, which would include all the resources for from operating this new facility in the coming year. Uh, next slide, I think is the last one. 
this is just revisiting the three main questions we're hoping to hear some feedback from city council about tonight. And I think maybe we can just kind of leave that there on the screen for now. And uh, that concludes the presentation and we look forward to the conversation. Thank you. I was taking it all in and then I realized it was my turn to speak. So my <laughs> apologies. Um, thank you, Mr. Reinhardt, Mr. Howard, and Ms. Natalia Jones um, for that presentation. Um, unless, are there any kind of technical clarifying questions? Um, if not, I'd like to go ahead to public comment. I know we have a lot of people who are excited to speak tonight. Thank you for coming. So City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our first regular business item, H1, provide direction on the proposed programming plan elements for the Menlo Park Community Campus. If you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine now. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to the clerk's desk. Okay, so our first speaker will be Jackie Seedland. Wow, I did not think that's how that was going to go. <laughs> uh, so really, um, I, it's mostly just thank you for all the things. Um, thank Council and Sean and Wondell and Natalia. Like they've been so helpful through the process and they've been including the neighborhood. And I feel like it represents like the conversations we've had. Now, to be fair, um, when I signed on to it, I, I did say that I, I did sort of hedge my initial commitment because I had a lot going on. So I said, I, so I was not at all the meetings, but I have really, um, <laughs> so I'm trying that to my, like, it really is capturing what we're doing. Um, and looking over the community feedback that we've had, like, it's clear that a sense of belonging is a need that's echoed by so many, like, not just here, but everywhere. And I think the merging of the library services with the community services is just awesome. I hope that we build a model that other communities might look to copy. I know that when we visited the Palo Alto Library, they were mostly full of all the reasons why that thing didn't work for them. But I like, I just love the way that we're thinking ahead of it so that it's going to be awesome. Um, I really appreciate how there is priority given to Bellhaven residents because, as we all know, this town is a really kind of complicated place to get around. Um, so it's nice that a priority space can be made for the people who have been here. And um, also, like, I love the recognition of the many residents of Bellhaven who have been trying to get increased library and community services for years through commissions and surveys and listening tours and getting our own council member. Like, um, so I really would just like to thank all of you for the work that you put in. The building is so beautiful. I love the tours that we've been allowed to go on. And just the way that you've tried to keep the community involved. And uh, yeah, that's really all I have. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. So, our next speaker will be Cheryl Bims, and this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item H1. Thank you, council, staff, and last but not least, residents. <laughs> <and fellow public. laughs> So this, um, I'm, I, I remain excited. This has been quite a ride, though. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, I remain excited, though, because I still feel like this project represents a really unique blend of a public-private partnership. Because first of all, you have the city. Come on, it's on public land. We're putting in city money toward a lot of what's going to be there. Taxpayers, that's us. <laughs> We're going to be, you know, on the dole for, for some of the money that's being spent too. So that's one. The um, meta, we can't leave them out. That's the, you know, the corporate entity put in the, the bulk of the money. And without them, we would not have even started this. But I also will never, ever, ever un underestimate the power of community because it was born in the community and believe me, the community did bear all the labor pains <laughs> for this, meaning we paid the cost. We definitely endured 
the impacts that come with development. And that is why we community members fought to bring this new project forward. Um, okay, so we're supposed to talk about, and I do have some donations, at least one three minute donation. But the one thing I did wanna add in terms of just the programming, um, I think it would be great to really find every single synergy that we can to exploit technology. We're right here in Silicon Valley. We're, we're right next to, no matter how you feel about a lot of the corporate entities, there are a lot of things that the youth can really benefit from uh, moving forward. So I think we need to do everything we can to exploit those, you know, those, those relationships. Um, and also use the library. Our programming could reflect maybe, you know, modules in the library that go along with some of the programming that's also offered, you know, through <laughs> everything else that we're doing. Uh, the other thing is like green initiatives. I'm like, my goodness, we're spending all this money to make this thing so super green. So why don't we do things to help the youth learn more about what's actually here? Show them, get the, I mean, get a certificate. Everybody loves a certificate or something, but that could be at all age levels. So those are some things just to think about because they're just, they're almost, you know, just right there at our hand. Now, the other thing I'm going to bring up in the other three minutes is there's been a lot of controversy. So this has been a fun project. Um, I still remain excited about it, but the a lot of the controversy has been around the naming. I mean, and I'm, I don't know, but the real, I think we really need to tread carefully with that because there is, um, there's, there's a lot that has gone on. Number one, as a city, I'm concerned that we're, we're kind of plowing through this in a way that we're not being realistic about how things are really getting done in the city. It's almost as if we feel like money is just falling, growing on trees and <laughs> there are these donors that are just waiting to give stuff to Menlo Park because everybody loves us so much. While we may be a lovable city at times, it, it, we have to be realistic about the resources and what it takes to keep this going. So along with that, I know I've in, many times in our uh, working group, I brought up the fact that, hey, why aren't we looking at seeing that some of these things are in doubt, meaning either the programming, the positions, you, you name it. But we need to think about those kinds of things. People love to invest in successful things. And um, if we're thinking along those lines, I think that will be powerful. And I will say um, a lot of the controversy, I'm going to say Onetta Harris. And, and I do want to say, as far as I know, there's never been an intention to wipe away her name or wipe away anyone's history. So I, I will be the first to say that. But what I will also say is this community has a very deep and robust history. And the more I do research trying to find out things, not only about Onetta Harris, but I'm learning about a lot of other very powerful people who have lived here. And there is no documentation. There are a lot of stories that are going untold. So I also feel that part of our programming needs to be accurately telling people about the history. But then too, I think we could um, kind of put to rest a lot of the, the controversy if we would just have conversations about ways that people feel would be proper to honor, you know, certain legacies. Um, meaning um, whether it be, monuments or think about this scholarships or even greater a foundation i mean we but we're not even getting to that because everybody's so embroiled on a name a name a name and then if it's not on a building it's one of the five entities inside what if we didn't put anybody's name inside of a building then what would we do with that imagine that or what if we did put a name inside of a building if you want to raise a million Two million, three million to put it there. It happens other places. So it's there, these are things to think about and not just sell ourselves so short, but at the same time realize the real cost of what it's going to take to do this. We haven't had programming over there that's going to run that number of hours and as rich as we want it to be. So we have to be realistic. So I appreciate that we've taken a step back and we're looking at programming because that is going to drive a lot of the cost and it's going to, you know you know, dictate a lot of how we run things as a city. But also I feel that we as a community collectively need to have some better conversation about how we can handle it. Because I believe there's some, some more powerful ways that we could really honor not only the current history, but, but a lot of the history people aren't aware of. And last but not least, we can't just keep our history too condensed. We are a very diverse group. So not, it's not like one group of people has a history here. Comprende? <laughs> so, I, you know, do you understand? Yes. 
because it's like we have a lot of people here, a lot of different groups, and I feel that we need to honor and recognize the entire community. Thank you. Well spoken. Thank you for your comment. I'm currently saying no for the cards or hands. Mayor Willison, you may continue. So I, I know a lot of folks came tonight. I just want to make sure in case you're feeling shy, um, this is your opportunity to speak to the council on your thoughts about the programming. We'd love to hear from you. Um, once once we turn it back to the diet, that means there's no longer an opportunity for members of the public to speak. So we'll just pause for 10 more seconds to make sure no last minute folks want to come to the mic. Oh, you're looking over here. <laughs> well, I have a card here and I'll bring it up. Okay. But just to, I should say, piggyback on what Cheryl Bim said. I think we have put too much energy, certainly on this discussion of renaming. Now, that's one thing that we aren't doing. We aren't renaming. We are naming. And if we could just turn the page for a minute and just think about what it takes to get your name on a city building. Just think about that for a minute. And I don't think that we give that any thought. I seem winded because I get excited about this. We have allowed it to get out of control. We should be celebrating this campus. And yet we're fighting among ourselves and even have the audacity to play the race card. There's no place for that in this deck. And as Cheryl said, that we have a diverse community and we have to recognize all of the things that people have contributed. And it's been quite a bit. Now, I was here at the time this building name went on before. This is a brand new campus, has nothing to do with the other building. So make sure that we know we aren't changing a name. We are creating a name for a new campus. Now, as Cheryl said, there are other ways to recognize any contribution that everyone has made, and it's been a lot. So, you know, cities are making policy and amending and changing every day. This really needs to come to a screeching halt. It's this all about this community and this city that is making decisions for what goes on in Menlo Park. We don't need any help. It's like someone coming into your home telling you what grocery list you should have. We, it's not allowed. What are we doing for Pete's sake? We are allowing other people to make our decisions. We are disrespecting or ignoring anyone. If there is a legacy, it will remain a legacy. Nothing's being erased. And this has absolutely no place to use racism. It doesn't belong in this decision. And we are insulting the donor. We have a gift and people are demanding that someone else's name go on it. I don't understand it. And as you can see, I've been here on this earth probably longer than some of you've been in the world. So we just don't want to make a mistake again of what we put on this building. It's a city building, and we have a donor that has gifted how many millions? <laughs> After they've passed 43, I don't count. But we need to 
stop and realize and think about what we are doing. Now, I, yeah, I see the big O now. So I just <laughs> want to, to see that we need to do better and we need to respect our community and this city. Thank you, Ms. Rose. All right. Um, so are there any other comments? Going once, going twice. Okay, then I am going to uh, bring it back to the city council um, for any questions or comments. Did anybody like to cook? What was that? Actually, before we get started, we will take a let's see. Let's take a break until eight fifteen. It's now eight oh eight. So that's a seven minute break. I believe there is one ladies' bathroom and one men's bathroom back there. So thank you.
Thank you, Mayor Willison. So having our city council back on our Bellhaven Branch Library Dais, Mayor Willison, you can reconvene the meeting. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, so we have reconvened the meeting. Many of our in-person attendees have gone home to watch the rest of the meeting on Zoom. Um, I do want to provide one more opportunity um, for folks to give comments um, prior to the council discussion. So this is really your last chance now to ask any questions or make any comments. Oh, and I, I got one. I got a live one, virtual comment. So city clerk, Karen. Thanks, Mayor Willison. So our next speaker will be Kenneth. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, go right ahead, Kenneth. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my name is Kenneth Harris. I, uh, I grew up in the Bellhaven area. Uh, Onetta Harris is my mother. And Onetta Harris was all about inclusion. Uh, this is not about racism. This is about e-racism, where you have legacies that have been intact for years. And these legacies, uh, that, that even based on your excerpt naming criteria, they deserve to be recognized. Yeah, there's other ways of getting money from donors, uh, et cetera. However, that's not what we're dealing with here. And and I don't wanna I don't want to put a lot of emphasis on the name per se but the spirit of a name and what a name represents, why a, an entity has a name on, on, on it in the first place. And then people will say, well, this person hasn't done much. It hasn't been documented. That's just not true. The truth of the matter is anytime, especially this council in 1983, the Menlo Park City Council named this by unanimous vote, the Oneta Harris community, unanimous vote. That has to stand as a precedence. Now, how we move forward with the name, oh, and by the way, I think you, the, the programming process is wonderful. I think the way that Bellhaven as a community has been giving consideration is wonderful. I am glad that Bellhaven is starting and finally getting the recognition that it deserves be it through this magnificent building that's being built in the spirit of the community. And hopefully the name will be a continuance of that spirit. But it's, it's, it's not about uh, racism. Racism has nothing to do with this. It's, every, it's about community. And that's all all of us want. All of us want a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of involvement. So I think that anything that's said and done should be done in the spirit of the community. Because the community is everything. This is a good project. Uh, we're all for the project. All of us are inside the community and outside the community. But we think that legacies should mean something. Legacies should stand for something based even upon your naming criteria. Uh, that's really all I have to say. Thank you for your comment. Okay, seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you, Mr. Harris, for your comment, and to everyone who uh, made comment this evening, and to everyone who came out to learn more about the project, to offer your thoughts, who took the survey, who are part of the working group, part of the subcommittee, thank you to my colleagues, to our staff, um, a tremendous, and to Meta, uh, a trend, tremendous amount of care has gone into getting us to where we are today, and I think today is a bit of a celebration, um, reading kind of what folks are imagining and hoping for in this new facility um, was quite quite a beautiful thing to read. 
Um, and now we're going to discuss um, a little bit more about how we turn that those lofty ideas from a policy level into implementation of how um, what policies the council thinks when we're looking both at the center, at the Bellhaven community, at Menlo Park in general, um, a lot of policy considerations to go through. So um, that's my teeing it up. And I would love to turn it over to one of my colleagues to start the discussion. Vice Mayor Taylor, please. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. And I think I asked staff to put up the three questions again that were up before the break. And just wanted to um, to share a, a few things, and that is Councilmember Nash and I actually um, had a conversation before the meeting just to really think about how we want to not just share what our thoughts are about um, about what we see in this in the staff report and also what our staff presented, which are primarily the same. However, there's something to be said when you can hear and feel the passion in our staff's voice when they talk about the vision for this new community center. And so one thing else that is important is for us to actually listen to you. Um, we don't get an opportunity to hear from all council members until we're in a, a council meeting. And so we listen to the public, we listen to our staff, and now it would be great to hear from you um, because we don't get to hear from you regularly. Thank you. So I'm just going to ask a follow-up question of the subcommittee then. Um, does the staff report and the desires in the staff or the direction in the staff report that's being recommended and that have been laid out by community members in the working group, do those reflect the subcommittee's position? Or are you wanting to first hear um, what your fellow colleagues have to say and then you're going to share kind of where you are? on that question. Um, thank you for the question, Mayor Wilson. And, and honestly, we have feedback that is, is slightly different um, and partly because we didn't get feedback from the working group prior. And so we just had a bunch of questions. Um, so we didn't want to pose those questions because there, it may not be the same thing that you are interested in hearing about, or well, maybe the same, I don't know. So if the, you're more comfortable with us starting I, off. I think it would be really helpful for um, the council to first hear from the subcommittee if possible, since you all have been closest to it. Um, so we can understand kind of your perspective of what we've now all seen. And then I do think it's gonna be, and for those members of the public, as Vice Mayor Taylor said, the city council is bound by a California law called the Brown Act, where um, we cannot discuss issues that are before us prior to a city council meeting. Um, that's why there's a subcommittee with only two of the five of us. Um, if it becomes three, that's a quorum and that's a Brown Act violation. So you are literally seeing kind of live conversation and understanding of each other's position in real time. So um, Vice Mayor Taylor, if you can please um, start off, that would be fabulous. Okay, thank you. So this, is, this isn't this is anything new. This was something that was shared, I believe, in the subcommittee meeting um, with staff. And that is uh, the subcommittee is adamantly against having corporate rentals in this facility. I'm starting out from the very small things to the larger things. The second is, and we didn't discuss this, but I'll say it because it was an issue at the previous facility. And that is making sure that there is covered patio area for the seniors. There wasn't prior. I think that is extremely important. And then also, I do not know if we've actually done any recent outreach to our senior community to make sure that the folks who are using the senior center are actually a part of the programming and providing some input um, based on what staff has already put together. Councilmember Nash, let me know when you want to get down here. <laughs> The next um, is the field user group. Um, we had a desire to continue or possibly continue the working group. And this is primarily to make sure that the folks using the field are actually folks who live in the Mopar, um, live in the community um, that want to use the space. And that also that there is some transparency to who is using it. The next is 
I had some um, outreach earlier from the president of the Bravesman School District and also the superintendent that wanted to make sure that Bellhaven Elementary School students also had access to the facility. Since it wasn't called out in the staff report, they assumed that the students were not included, um, which the policy should be all students who live in the neighborhood have access. Um, that includes folks who are homeschooled as well. The aquatics program, since we have not um, completed our work, um, Councilmember Nash and I are also on that subcommittee. Um, we do have some concerns that, that whomever we contract with, it doesn't matter if they provide aquatic services, that their intention isn't just to make Nemo Park residents a part of their profits. Um, we'd like to have some best practices in anybody that we contract with to make sure that they treat all Nemo Park residents um, respectfully and inclusively. And also providing, because um, I have a concern just about access to technology, um, who knows how to use what, because you know different software is different. Um, but just making sure that we, that we are being thoughtful about that, um, whomever we use as contractors, uh, if they're the only way to reserve space or to find out about classes is using technology, we need to find ways to make sure that everyone, um, that, it, that it is visible for everybody and accessible for everyone. So if we have to print out some paper or QR codes or have a, a docking station where folks can walk into our facility and actually access things on the spot. Councilmember Nash, is there anything else that you want to go ahead? So, yes. Yes, it's on. Thank you. Um, thank you. I thought that was an excellent summary. Um, overall, I would say that the staff report did um, do an excellent job of summarizing what we heard at the working group meetings. Um, I think one of the challenges now is going to be taking all of those words and putting them into action and actually figuring out what it is that we want um, as the center opens, because this will be something where we certainly can't do everything and sort of how do we want to prioritize it? How do we want to switch things up so that we can try and get as much of the programming that's exciting um, programming that's been discussed um, implemented at some point, but how do we want to do that? Do we want to rotate um, classes? We're just working on all of how to actually implement all of this. Um, but thank you for the excellent job summarizing all of the, um, the programs, the work, um, the discussions. And I think that that's um, pretty much it. Just, um, I guess one more comment is just to emphasize um, the last point that uh, Vice Mayor Taylor made which is even just in the meeting just now, I heard someone who, um, while they're connected, is communication and making sure that we are able to communicate with people um, in ways other than just sending emails. Um, someone was just saying that they just had heard about this meeting um, from a neighbor, even though, yes, they received an email or perhaps more than one email about it, but they just don't check email that much. They actually thought the electronic sign board that we have um, is an excellent way to communicate um, information for things such as meetings. But just, um, I think one of the challenges, not just for our city, but just everywhere, is how to better communicate with um, residents in our case. So thank you. Um, it was great hearing what you had to say. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to ask either Council Member Door or Council Member Combs to hear your thoughts for the first time on this topic. Hmm? Council Member Door. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for the, the thoughtful presentation and all the energy and thoughtful work that has gone on to make the NPCC and make this into what it is and what it will be. Um, to our staff as well as to community members that have been so active in its creation. Um, first, I want to just say that the, the programming opportunities that have been laid out here 
are so exciting. And I'm thrilled for this center, and I know our community is going to be thrilled. Uh, and I deeply appreciate the work that went into public engagement, and also the fact that you have the staffs on 900 people reached with responses. Um, that kind of level of detail and being able to share back with us about how many people have been reached and engagement is really important. And I also echo Councilmember Nash in saying, what else can we do? How else can we make it even more accessible in the way that we're communicating? Um, I'm thinking about for the students, you know, leaflets going home with students or, you know, some, something else in addition uh, there, but just want to commend all the thoughtful public engagement that has already gone on. Um, another thing I saw laid out in the plan was uh, the inclusion of work with nonprofits. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity um, as a way to uh, engage in other dialogues that are happening in our community, a way to bring in other expertise and capacities to help create more enrichment programs. Um, a, a question and a curiosity that comes up for me as I looked at the plan and all the, you know, the fantastic list here is ensuring that our programming is sustainable in the long term, that we're able to create and sustain these programs for, for multiple years so that students and not just young, young people, but elders, seniors, adults of all ages can uh, all benefit from this programming. And so with long-term sustainability, I'm thinking about um, a member from the public shared, it could be endow programs, or can we do programs with nonprofits? Are there other things we can do to ensure that um, no matter what really thoughtful programming that you guys have outlined here can continue in the long-term? So that's something I'm thinking about. Um, I, I really deeply appreciate uh, Vice Mayor Taylor and Councilmember Nash for raising a few of the issues and opportunities that you shared with us, um, in particular on the corporate rentals. I know mentioned here on the working group's proposed operational policy elements, they mentioned uh, wanting to look at the rental policy to ensure that it is neighborhood oriented and resident oriented. Um, those two values align deeply with me and what I would hope that we do and uh, corporate rentals does sound a little bit uh, like an antithesis to that. And so curious to hear more about that. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Doerr. Um, Council Member Combs, you're up. Thank you, Mayor Rosen. Um, so I'm certainly not gonna talk about the name. <laughs> I made that mistake a couple of council meetings ago. Um, <clears throat> Overall, like I commend the um, um, the subcommittee and, and working group for, for all, all uh, the work that they, they've done. I, I don't think I have much additional to add, although I think you know, what plus one in terms of some of the, the tenor of, of, um, by, um, of uh, Councilmember Nash's comments and and focusing on um, th there was a lot there. <laughs> Right, and, and obviously all of it can't be delivered, and and I, I would just encourage you to to focus on on the things that you think you can deliver well, right? And and some of that has to do with what's the resourcing available to you, like right? If you've got like for the maker space, you've got a guy or gal that's really into that, who you know you can tap to do that, then then that's great. You lean into that, but for some of the programming, at least initially, you might not be able to find a person. Who, who does that well. And I, I do think I would sort of um, give you the direction to give yourself um, some space <laughs> to, 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 to not sort of push um, when, when maybe you, you don't see the right person there or when the model isn't there at that, that, that moment. Um, and that, that, yeah, it doesn't have to be that you lean in um, to everything on an opening, but, but maybe you, you, you focus on the things obviously that, that you felt that you can deliver well and that you have the, the talent and the resourcing to, to deliver. Um, so those would be my, my, my general like, like guidance. Other, other than that, like, you know, hats off to all the work that, that has been done. Thank you, Council Member Combs. So um, I want to um, basically agree with almost everything that my colleagues have said. Um, I do have some questions. Um, for staff. So um, the way that um, some of the language is written about who the facility will serve, um, and I'm thinking almost like these, these circles. So there's like Menlo Park, there's potentially Bellhaven, long um, time Bellhaven residents. 
Um, and when we talk about priority access or servicing a specific user group, how is that possible? Like I see one thing of designing programs and prioritizing programs for specific groups, but I'm curious in execution and implementation, how or if it's even possible to, I don't wanna use the word exclusive, but I, I just wonder how you envision some of those um, visionary statements playing out in real life. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, the answer is, uh, I think it kind of depends a little bit on, on the program. There are a, a number of different methods that are currently employed in other jurisdictions, even in our own, and maybe some new ones to kind of incentivize use by residents or specific groups uh, uh, people with disabilities, for example. Um, so one example specific to this would be in the library branch to um, make it such that the book collection uh, can't be placed on hold remotely. Uh, people have to physically come to the library branch to get the books. And so what that does is sort of prioritize in a way folks who are really near the facility Right, because you physically have to travel there. Same thing with like um, registering for, for classes. You know, you give priority to folks who do an in-person registration, and that's gonna, you know, really kind of uh, emphasize folks who are, you know, within really easy traveling distance who live in the neighborhood. So that's one way. Some other ways would be, you know, around fees for, you know, many programs or rentals, they do have fees. And so of course you can structure the fees to, you know, really, um, you know, give priority or uh, um, prioritization to like residents or specific groups, or you could, you know, conversely, you could do discounts there. So that's just a, a couple of the needs. Um, and it really kind of depends a little bit on, on the individual program or service, but understanding that that's the, kind of the overall vision and that helps the staff to kind of figure out the best mechanism to implement it. Thank you for answering that. Um, your example of coming and registering in person um, to me makes a lot of sense because I was thinking, how does this work? Because <laughs> um, we all have the same zip code in Menlo Park. And then it's like, is the person at the rec center checking exactly which streets or do you get a, a thing on your ID card that says you're Bellhaven resident or please just right here. Well, on that point, I do, I do want to point out that we do actually have that okay. geographic capability in our current systems for tracking user accounts so we, we can identify, you know, their, their address of residence and all of those things with just the scan of a card. Yes, I, uh, I'm sorry. I just want to mention one thing, and that's um, the in-person immediately registration immediately set off some alarm bells with me because not everyone is able to get away from work depending on when the registration is. So I'm sure <laughs> you will consider that. Well, while we're on the subject, you know, and this is where I think, you know, over the next couple of months, we are going to be really getting into these details. And there's also folks who maybe just have other mobility challenges. So we have to really think through all of these different options. And it could be kind of a menu that sort of covers all those bases. And there's not going to be a one size fits all. That's why it's kind of by program. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, so going back to and again, I totally, um, I love reading all of the, the programming ideas and the value statements, and they totally resonated with me. Um, I personally feel more comfortable with designing the programs um, and having them speak to the Bellhaven community rather than like um, making it exclusive for Bellhaven. I would love to see, I, whether we like it or not, the new building is going to attract people from all over the city, um, and it should absolutely, you know, be speaking to people in the Bellhaven community. It should feel the most comfortable. I remember years ago when we were having initial conversations, 
people were talking about the couch that they like and the artwork on the wall. And they wanted to feel like it didn't feel like this too shiny tech oriented newcomer feel. They wanted to feel when they walked in that it was like coming back home. And I know folks have been displaced in order to, to have this building. Um, so I'm all for making it feel homey specifically. Um, I just, um, I wanted you to just think about how we execute um, the implementation again of, of that. Um, and with cost recovery and kind of fee as a barrier, I love that principle. I'd actually love to see that principle more citywide. Um, you know, there's folks in all of our districts, I think, um, who probably struggle, um, who live in older apartments and who are, you know, potentially, um, would love to participate in our programs but might find them cost prohibitive. So um, again, um, I'd love that to, to be given a little more thought. Um, speaking about some of the um, items that were mentioned by some of our speakers, I love the comment about really emphasizing um, the environmental aspects and doing some programming around that. Um, I was also thinking, you know, one of the beautiful things that's happened in Bellhaven with um, the election of our vice mayor to the city council is really Bellhaven finding a very strong voice um, and advocacy in our community and helping to train other community members and kind of build a bench of community leaders in the Bellhaven community and doing like a civics 101 for community members and Bellhaven. Again, probably something good to do um, at Burgess also. But I think if we want to prioritize doing that because that would pay dividends in terms of ongoing, which I think is kind of the theme that I've heard from some of my colleagues too. And one of my biggest, um, I don't want to say it's concerns, but um, when I read the staff report, to be honest, the thing I put at the top was just a dollar sign. <laughs> um, and so I really, like my colleagues have said, want to focus on how is this sustainable, not just financially, but as folks have said, on our ability to run these programs, um, not overcommit, um, utilize the community organizations, um, roll it out in a way that we're not over-promising and potentially under-delivering. And also when I think about how folks in other parts of the city might be attracted to the center, on the one hand, yes, that's not the focus of, of the center, but to achieve the sustainability of the center, some of these programs might need more bodies from all over Menlo Park and it could be a good thing and also it helped bring our city together as one community and I'd love to see kind of cross-pollination in that way. Um, so um, yeah really thinking about that. Um, see. I like the idea of um, the history of Bellhaven and really highlighting um, some of the work probably that um, Menlo Together did on the Color of Law, um, Menlo Park Edition. I, I know some of the negative history, but some of the community leaders, um, like Carly Clark, and I'm sure there's many, many more um, who could be highlighted. Um, and in terms of any program that's missing, I brought this up like a while ago and nobody seemed to bite at it. I'll try to bring it up one more time, but I like food. Um, and I, don't, I know there's gonna be like a vending machine there, but when I think of community center, I think of people, you know, maybe having a cup of coffee or something. So if there's any way to invite people to get cozy there and have a cup of coffee and meet a friend there in the community, gather around. I know the seniors will have food, um, but some some way to, to let people stay. Um, so those are my initial thoughts, but um, I appreciate everything. I hope we can do everything. <laughs> um uh well you know we'll we'll see what happens but um it it was really exciting to read thank you any other reactions thought yes council member nash so i really appreciate everyone's thoughts i think it is um it's exciting to hear regarding your um comment and i like to word cross colonization um, one of our ideas especially as we're talking about aquatics um but just generally across um 
all of our programs, all of our facilities, is we really do want them, every facility welcome, welcoming to every resident and every person, but specifically focused on residents um, in the city. And we want to make sure that people in Bellhaven feel comfortable going to any facility and that people elsewhere in the city feel comfortable going to um, the MPCC or anything, but really um, we are looking not for um, areas by um, geographic regions, but really to um, make it all welcoming. Um, with traffic, it does yeah. tend to reinforce that people go to something that's more local, that's easier to get to, but we really do want to make sure that um, everybody is feeling welcome everywhere. And that's something that's very, very true when we're looking at the products as well. Thank you. Going back to what Mayor Wilson loves, uh, food. So I know that this was a conversation, I want to say over three years ago, about what um, is possible. Um, and so can you remind me of what's possible um, outside of a vending machine? So the, the quick answer is most likely, most feasible option would be some form of like food cart, puppy kiosk kind of thing that's uh, more mobile. And, and part of that is to just stay within the confines of the uh, CEQA exemption for the project, which you know kind of has to preserve sort of the existing facilities without adding new. So there's limited square footage in the facility. But um, I'm recalling those conversations from a few years ago. So we made sure that they were power uh, connections out, especially in the plaza out front, so that like um, a food kiosk or coffee kiosk could easily be set up out there. And is that something to, to put on the working groups um, agenda, possibly? Yes, I mean, and I'm glad that this actually has come back so that we can like zero in on it in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. Yeah, I never forget about food, so <laughs> I wasn't going to let that one go. I, I, I do have just a, a couple of comments. I really um, appreciate you bringing up the, the green space and then also just looking at the history and the legacy of the community and how that can evolve into something, into programming. Not sure what yet. Um, and then also bringing up Civics 101, because there was a Civics 101, I want to say five or six years ago, that was held at the main library. It was, um, and outside. It, it was great. Um, I happen to have participated in it, so it, it does have value. <laughs> um, but um, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I believe those from home for all of my comments. I just really want to emphasize no vending machines. I wanted to move them out of the last facility. Um, does anyone else have any other comments, suggestions? Uh, staff, folks, do you feel like you have what you need from us? Is this the level of direction you were seeking? Any outstanding questions have we answered so does the programming align with our vision and expectations it seems like it does um additional programming elements we want food <laughs> and other things <laughs> what was that as well as civics 101 as well as civics 101 of course <laughs> and environmental education we should oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what we said um and do the statements about who the mpcc will serve and how this programs and services will be prioritized to meet our expectations. So I know I spoke a little bit about that distinction. Does anyone else want to comment about that? Yes, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mary Wilson. So I'm not sure how you are going to do this, but to actually prioritize the priorities yeah. because the list is long. And I really like the suggestion of having an endowment um, looking at scholarships, some ways to in, embed sustainability into the programming. Um, Ms. Benz had some fantastic ideas. We're just trying to think about, I don't know how you're going to prioritize that. Um, I know you may only be able to do five out of the 25, but just how can you prioritize that list? Um, 
what do you want to bring first? I think Council Member and Matt, you brought that up to me earlier as well. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I think it's a, I'd love to hear the answer, but as I was going in the back to use the facilities during our break, there was um, a couple of people back there and I said, you know, what are you looking for forward to? And the woman said yoga and the man said ballroom dancing and the woman said ceramics. So I think there's no end to the, the appetite. So um, I don't know if you have an answer to Vice Mayor Taylor's, but I, it's a great question. I'm curious about that as well. That's certainly a big part of the plan. How do we sort of prioritize based on what we're hearing from the city council, from the community, how do we put it into action? And I think as uh, in the timeline kind of set forth um, earlier in the presentation, we're gonna be drilling into those details with the commissions and then again with the city council to kind of just see which items really kind of float to the, the top of that prioritization. You know, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, put the, I don't want to say put the cart before the horse, but that's the, the person that comes to mind because we kind of have to work our way toward that through conversations with all the stakeholders to kind of identify, you know, where those, those prioritizations are. Thank you. And, and just a, another comment, just looking at the timeline that's on page um, H123, the timeline does not include the working group. So I, I don't know how they fit in and making sure that things come to them before they're going to the library commission and the parks and Recreation. Yeah, yes, it absolutely. There's, I think there's a note in the staff report that uh, that timeline doesn't necessarily list every single working group meeting, but it does recognize that those, those meetings are occurring and they they pretty much conform with the flow that you can see there in the timeline. So basically, we have got digital steps. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think one of the things that will be critical with all of this is just as much transparency as possible so that people know what's happening. Um, there's opportunities for input that just as things um, move on, move off, um, speed up, slow down, just that we provide as much transparency as possible. The one other piece that I wanted to put in is this will be an emergency um, center. I'm not sure exactly what the, the disaster um, center. So I think some sort of um, programming around that, or at least acknowledgement, some sort of um, information would also be something that we should make sure that we're addressing in addition to the exciting prospect of having a center. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Nash, for bringing that up. Just to surface that, yes, it will be um, a Red Cross emergency shelter. It's actually being constructed to level four seismic standards so that it can stand a major seismic event and serve as a shelter. Um, so uh, that's going to be a big part of the operating plan is to make sure that it's ready for that on day one. Hopefully, we never have to use it. And has a microgrid so that it will be self sustaining. That's cool. I have one more comment. Yeah. Yes, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. Um, and that is, hopefully we will have electric shuttles then. But I just want to put electric shuttles out there, a wonderful activity shuttle for the city of Summer Park that visits all of our facilities, um, pools included. I just wanted to um, mention that. And then also in this, probably is a better conversation offline just to talk about some of the I think some of the barriers that can be removed to the application process. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this offline, but just some barriers that can be removed there. For this, this is for um, either subsidized, discounted, or what have you, but sometimes the application process is a little lengthy. Um, and if we know they live in a community or live in a city, just try to eliminate barriers instead of that. Actually, um, sorry, we were, I was wrapping it up and then all these things are popping in our <laughs> minds. I do want to comment for one moment. So I completely agree with my colleagues about the corporate rentals as this is for residents. This is not a money-making endeavor. I, I don't know if I'm ready to have an absolute no way um, I think we could probably achieve a prioritization thing where it's at the very, 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 very bottom or something. But 
we haven't seen, we're going to be having budget conversations. And as we're talking about long-term financial um, livelihood of the center, I don't want to throw that possibility out. Um, of course, if there's kids or a senior program or something that should absolutely take priority, but I don't know if I want to unilaterally say we wouldn't even consider doing something, especially if we don't know what the economic uh, future brings. So I just wanted to see if my colleagues would be open to that possibility, completely agreeing with the sentiment behind the statement. So following up on that, what's our policy and closures um, for current savings that we're using? X, what was that one more time? So, um, for the Burgess facility, do, do we allow all the rentals? Yeah, so at the moment, yes, we do. So, all, all rentals um, at a first come, first like, right, basis at the moment. And, and if you're a resident, right, you get, um, you get, it's like a different rate, right? A discount rate. Like yes, there's there's a, a, a resident and a non resident, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, as an aside, I remember one time they couldn't find my address, and so I actually had to pay the non resident rate. But that's so um I, I think i would echo the mayor's uh, statement I, I think uh, an across the board prohibition especially because th that would like not align with with how we approach current facilities um i, I think i would be cautious of if we're giving direction at the moment uh, on this, and I, I don't know um, if, if, if it's the area where you guys are with, with that as a, as a policy. But yeah, I, I appreciate the sentiment. And, and I think in the same way as echoing what the, the mayor is saying as far as like who we're targeting. Again, the idea is to um, have an idea of, of the resident that you want to feel most included um, in, 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 this, um, in this venue. But that, that, that that's the target, like right. But it's open to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but you're designing it with a certain a certain uh, uh, person, or population, or community in mind. But but at the end of the day, to whoever comes through the door, um, and who wants to um, um, you know, make use of what's what's offered is is that I think uh, is that as a, for for me the approach we would, we would want to to take. Um, and I would say again just. We, you know, going back to my my point as far as the programming, some of these programs will fail. <laughs> like, right? you, will, you will offer something, and two people will show up. Um, I don't know if it's ballroom dancing or ceramics, but and and I just I would say like you know, um, um, within obviously some sense of that that, that there are, are financial issues at play, but to give us some grace that that, that there are some things that you will, we will throw out the wall and that we won't stick, and it will be iterative. And I, I think over over time you will find the right programming, or the right, right programming mix um, um, that 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 works for for the community here and for for the larger community again. Because as it's been said, um, we, you know it is a a community center center um, for for the whole community you know, ultimately, and that's um, what what we want to make sure is is reiterated, even though. It goes to solving some historical um, um, issues and, and lack of availability of facilities in this specific community. And, and no one wants to lose sight of that, but um, but it is ultimately for the whole community. So I am up for including corporate rentals as long as it does not interfere with access by residents. And that's the big concern um, with all of the facilities, fields, everything. And it's a balancing act with the costs and all. And I, um, it's something that's not unique to MPCC, but people are extremely, we are all very worried about just making sure that this bright, shiny new object that is specifically in a community that hasn't had a bright, shiny new object or even many of the other many of the um just parts of the facility that will be coming forward um, like a, a nice gym things like that that they are not 
um, that they are for the community, that it's open to free time or for classes that are for the community, and that um, we really have that as high priority. Um, while yes, there, um, you know, perhaps there's a corporate uh, rental in some situations, but really making sure that it's this is for the community. Um, I am hoping that the that we can just make sure that if there is a corporate rental, it's not 100 days out of the year. It's maybe three times a year that it's at minimum. There are hotels around where you can rent space. There's plenty of things. Yeah, I think um, maybe we'd like to have Director to come back with a proposal on what that would look like. Um, and I mean. If all of you had extra time on your hands, it would be great to revisit our rental policy in general um, as it aligns with cost recovery, because I have been getting feedback about field space and everything. Um, I don't know if that's realistic, you know, this year or this, whatever this is, but I, I do, I think we all are um, projecting the same desire, concern, of um, this not running away from the community. Um, but I think you get that, but I, th I think we wanna have some kind of bumper rails on it so that there's some assurances that it doesn't get out of hand. Thank you, I really appreciate this, um, this part of the discussion because uh, actually pretty important um, and it conveys the staff that this is one of those priority items. And so to your question, Mayor, it seems like this is something that the staff had already identified, actually, that we need to revisit these policies in advance of the facility opening. There's been a lot of questions about them. I think one thing we're hearing clearly is uh, a, a different direction than maybe what had existed some years ago, which uh, some years ago may have been, you know, kind of maximized cost recovery was the, maybe the direction before. And now we're hearing something that's a, a bit more balanced, which is really focus on the community, and sure, recover costs, obviously, we have to operate, but make sure that the community isn't displaced or you know, kind of shoved aside in service to that goal. I mean, I'm just trying to reiterate what I think I'm hearing from the city council today. It's incredibly important for us as staff um, so that we can bring back to you some of these policy suggestions you know, that kind of reflect what we're hearing. There are certainly ways to prioritize through scheduling and some other means to ensure that you know, the community has that primary access, but there's a space in those corporate channels and that it's, it's reasonable and it's balanced. Thank you. One of the pieces that um, might be helpful along with that, but it does add more work, so take that into consideration, is just some reports periodically that give us information. Um, as Mayor Wilson said, yes, one of the um, pieces that I hear fairly regularly now from residents is they don't have access to whatever, tennis courts, pickleball courts, um, you know, soccer, yeah, fields, um, whatever. And sometimes it's not for organized activities. People want to be able to play frisbee and don't have, can't find fields. Um, so I think just at some point when we do have, um, when staff has time to have some sort of report that comes to council every year, every half year, whatever you, Think makes sense just sort of as a check in to see and also as a reality check for us um, for the comments that we're receiving. And um, I rarely think back on my business degree, but I do want to just make sure we do have a budget meeting coming up um, because when you say, you know, the direction in the past was high cost recovery, you know, well, why was it high cost recovery? Because that it might have been a different time in terms of economics and where are we heading now in terms of our economic landscape and whatnot. So I'm not saying we cut it here and put it there, but I think um, having more information would be really helpful so we can make um, the best decision we can. Yeah, that's from Renash. That just makes me think, um, part of the balancing is how many hours it's open, but if it's open, a lot of hours, but those hours are not open to the community, that's a 
whole different story. And so maybe part of the balancing also is just what does the big picture look like? Now, after we just asked you if you had everything, then went on <laughs> for another 25 minutes. Is there any further comments from the diet? Okay, anything else you're looking for that you want us to just start talking about? <laughs> yes, Mr. Reinhardt. I just really want to express our thanks. This has been an incredibly helpful conversation. We very much appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Go back, keep at it. We can't wait to see you back and to hear more about this thrilling project we have ahead of us. And again, thank you to all members of the public for caring, for being part of this process. And we look forward to all of you at the grand opening, hopefully sooner than later. Twenty. What's the latest? 2024. 2024. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. You're welcome. Okay, so I don't believe there is any um, motion needed on that item. So we are going to move on to our second regular business item, which is H2, receive and file report on labor relations and receive public input on upcoming labor negotiations with Service Employees International Union Local 521 an American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 829. And to introduce this item is our Administrative Services Director, Brittany Mello. Good evening, Ms. Mello. Good evening, City Council. Um, are you able to hear me? <laughs> is, that, is that working? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now, now. Okay. <laughs> uh, so good evening. I'll be providing a brief introduction of this item. So the item before you this evening is a procedural item really aimed to improve public outreach and awareness and input in the labor negotiations process. The city is preparing to negotiate successor memoranda of understanding with two of our employee union, our groups. Uh, the first is Service Employees International Union, or SEIU, Local 521. That unit is comprised of our frontline personnel, non-sworn. You can really think of it as our general employee unit. It is our largest unit with about 168 budgeted positions. Uh, and then we have our second group, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, or ASME, Local 829. That group is comprised of our non-sworn supervisors. Both agreements are set to expire on June 30th, 2023. The staff report and the attachments provide a detailed cost breakdown of the wages and benefits for each employee group. And it also helps clarify the different roles of the individuals involved in the negotiations process. And so with that, I'm really here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mello. And, um, so unless there's any clarifying questions, Ms. Heron, can you please call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item H2, receive and file report on labor relations and receive public input on upcoming labor negotiations with SEIU and AFSCME, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on regular business item H2. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron. I left the mic on that time, so <laughs> didn't have that awkward thing. Okay. Um, there was no public comment. No comment. Great. Um, does anyone on the diet have any questions, comments? So just to clarify where we are in the process, tonight's item is really to hear from the public if there's any considerations they want us to have prior to us going into closed session and then for labor negotiations to take place. Because the next time this comes back to the public, we will be voting on a contract and kind of whatever has happened will have happened. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's correct. So at the next city council meeting on April 25th will be our first opportunity to meet with the city council in closed session to initiate the bargaining process. Uh, and then we'll be coming back when a tentative agreement has been reached uh, with either or both associations. Okay. So given that we did not hear any feedback from the public, um, is, is there a motion that's required for this one? Yes. Okay. So does anyone have any comments or would someone like to make a motion? Uh, Council member Nash has a comment. I just wanted to say, I don't know if it's because it's my fifth time through this or what, but this staff report was excellent. It was very easy to read and it had a lot of really interesting information, which you can tell from the next time. Thank you. Council member comes. Yeah, we're just we're accepting. Receiving five. Okay, so it's all information. And I, I will point out that when this does come to closed session, you can come and make a political minute about it. Thank you for clarifying, Council Member Combs. Very true. I think this is also just letting the public know that we're about to initiate these negotiations. So thank you for clarifying that. So a motion has been made by Council Member Combs. Is there a second? Uh, a second. Okay, Councilmember Dora is seconding. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Councilmember Combs, a second by City Councilmember Dora to receive and file a report on employee compensation and receive public input on upcoming labor negotiations with SEIU and AFSCME. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Councilmember Combs? Yes. City Councilmember Dora? Yes. City Councilmember Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Woolison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So from time to time, we have a section, which is I, City Council Initiated Item. And in accordance with City Council Procedure CC20013, City Council Initiated, initiated Items, the following agenda items are to be considered by the City Council and can ask staff questions regarding preliminary scope, analysis, and resource requirements. After discussion with the motion and second, the city council may take one of the following actions. Direct the city manager to prioritize staff resources to prepare a formal staff report for further city council consideration and or direct the item to an advisory body for preparation of a formal staff report with no additional staff support required or Direct the city manager to prepare a formal staff report for further city council consideration as resources are available, or to defer action to the city council's annual goal setting process. And the item that we are uh, taking under consideration was made, the request was made by Vice Mayor Taylor at the last meeting, which is I-1, direction on advisory body and commissioner statement. So, um, City Clerk Karen, would you please call for public comment? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our uh, City Council initiated item I-1, direction on advisory body and commissioner stipends, participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If calling in from a landline or cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on item I-1. And our first speaker will be Pam Jones, followed by Adina Levin. Um, thank you, Council, and, um, again. And uh, thank you for having this item on the agenda. I, I think it's a really powerful uh, measure to uh, let the community know that they are valued, that their time is valued, and that Free volunteering is not always the best way to do things. Um, you may want to consider that, um, uh, particularly with the planning commission, that they have um, that, that their pay is the same way yours is. Their stipend is the same way that yours is. So, um, you know, they, they money goes into stirs and all those other things that I don't know about. Um, but again, thank you for um, having this on the agenda, and I hope you all support it so it can go back to staff. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Adina Levin. Uh, good evening, 
mayor council members and staff, uh, Dean Eleven, um, speaking to the letter that was sent uh, for Menlo together. Um, so um, uh, with uh, uh, Menlo together supporting uh, inclusion and uh, diverse participation across the community, um, we do think that um, considering stipends for people serving on commissions and advisory bodies is a good thing for council uh, to consider. This is considered a good practice for uh, you know nonprofit community-based organizations to uh, help uh, uh, include um, uh, people to participate um, for whom uh, finances might be a, a barrier, and um, just to um, uh, encourage participation. Um, there are some other cities that do this, so that if uh, staff research, research uh, goodness gracious, it's a little late and I can't talk, but um, uh, to do research to find out um, what other uh, bodies do. Um, as a personal disclosure, I serve on the uh, Metropolitan Transportation's um, Policy Advisory Council, and um, those advisory bodies uh, do pay stipends for participating in uh, a regional body, and um, this is certainly something that would be good for the city to consider. Thank you very much. Oh, and uh, so sorry, uh, one more thing as uh, is related to this in terms of um, uh, being inclusive, the um, it would be good good for the city if it does not yet have one to have a policy for language translation and interpretation um, to provide greater inclusion for people whose uh, most comfortable language is not English. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So I'd like to um, ask Vice Mayor Taylor if she would like to speak first since she initiated this item. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. And, and thank you for getting on the agenda um, so quickly and staff. And my request is, is basically a stipend um, program that's eligible for CalPERS service credit if possible, I'm not sure if that's possible, um, but I think it's good to start with, especially with our planning commissioners, um, considering their role um, in the amount of time in their agendas, um, I think it would be a great place to start. And that's all. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. And actually I'll jump in with a question for staff, the million dollar question. Um, how, so, also, I want to clarify for members of the public and for us, we are not discussing the merits of whether we um, want to have a stipend or not want to have a stipend or what that would look like, but we're talking about whether it's a topic worthy of taking time on our very busy agendas. So um, I'd like to ask um, the city manager's office, um, how would that fit in in your mind? How much staff work would it take? when would you foresee being able to bring this back and all those fun staff capacity questions? Hello. Hello. Is it audible out there? Very great. Thanks. It makes no difference to me where I, where I sit because <laughs> the speaker's over there. Uh, so thank you, Mayor. So as the kind of um, staff report outlines and it's just verbatim from the council's policy there's four four basic op options so i think i'll just kind of go through that a little bit because i could help set the stage for which direction the council may, may, may want to go so there's four bullets uh the the first is um kind of directing the city manager to prioritize resources and i can kind of talk about that so i think that's that's one consideration Second one is about a referral to an advisory body. I think in this case, it's not a matter for referral, so it's within the purview of the city council. So you can kind of rule that one out. The third bullet would be also be uh, kind of similar to the first bullet as a potential consideration. And then the last one is deferring until the annual goal setting process. As the council knows, um, council recently conducted its goal, goal setting process. Um, I think this topic was brought up um, 
uh, either shortly before or during that meeting or various uh, bits of correspondence. So I think it boils down to the first or third bullet. It's um, uh, timely now and that the city is in, there is a, there would be a, financial resources associated with it. So the upcoming um, budget process would be an appropriate time to, to consider this. I think it would be a matter of if it's a extremely um, limited extent of, of research, it's pretty, but pretty, um, pretty um, fundamental consideration for the, for the council, just like how, how much money the council would like to, to put towards, toward, towards this. So I think uh, through the upcoming budget process, the council was interested in this topic, the staff would do the uh, research of some other cities, the, the legal research of what is allowable or not allowable as the city being a um, general law city, and put that as part of the uh, council considerations in terms of this upcoming budget process, and then when the, when the, what the implementation trigger would be, would it be beginning of the fiscal year, would it be the next um, Round of recruitments for commissioners, because as the council knows, we're in a very active recruitment process, right? The second closes this Friday is the city clerk. So I think it's pretty much whether or not the council wants to consider it as part of this budget cycle. And we need that direction tonight if we want to want it um, uh, considered in these coming months. So thank you, City Manager Murphy. So to clarify then, would there be an actual agenda item about it or it's us directing you to kind of put it in like an option for the budget to be considered um i, I can kind of I, I guess from from where i sit with overall agenda management it'd probably be uh, easier frankly this part of a consideration for the budget process so the next time the council's going to be even thinking about budget and hopefully with some overall context of the city's financial uh, situation of the April 25th. So if tonight, if we are interested in understanding more about this and considering it for this coming fiscal year, then but it's kind of like a fifth option almost because you're not actually preparing an agenda item. It's, it's almost like we're adding a little bullet up here is like weave it into the we budget into consideration process. Context. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments on this topic? And someone will call the letter of the annual expenses paid by the city and that gets the stipend to the city council. So so um so that's the stipend and then the retirement contributions, but not the health care, um, which which is not my understanding part of this proposal, although it was part of I think the initial idea was also this, this idea that possibly also medical insurance um, when it was first uh, broached not by uh, Vice Mayor Taylor but but I think by a member of one of the city's commissions, and so I I just think it would um, provide me some some clarity because I, I think this item would be no less than the council one because i i don't know how you even at the council one I, I don't know that this really like opens up um uh a, a, an additional sort of portions of the residents um because and, and I, I don't mean to dis dismiss it but it, it it's still fairly nominal um even at the council level. So I would assume you could do no less than council. And so I, I just want to try to benchmark like how, how much we would be talking about. Because um, again, it's not just what we get paid or the stipend, but then it's also like the retirement obligations that, 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 that attach. Thank you, council member Crum. Um, so what, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, obviously it's a staff question. I wanna make sure we're not going to the merit. We need to get enough information to be able to decide whether to weave it in. My interest actually is, I'm not sure how far I want it. There's the money, the stipend, then there's the, the pension thing, there's insurance. Um, so I might be willing to do some of it, but not all of it. So I guess when it comes, to a budget and then there's like how much is the stipend so when staff does bring it forward 
how would you be, which option would you be going with, or would you be providing a menu of budgetary options? Like, here's a couple different recommendations if you want to pursue this policy to weave into the budget, ranging from a cash dollar amount of X to the suite of benefits. But does that help? I mean, I, I don't understand the constraints. I do think. If, if getting to the merits, it becomes a distinction without a difference <laughs> because I, I have to get to some of the merits to understand whether I think you, you know the staff should should invest. I, I have to make some at least initial That's fair. Um, assessment. Um, and so, but but I totally get you. Like maybe that assessment isn't the money. <laughs> maybe that's it. It's 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 bigger about whether we think that this is something we should do. Um, and the actual sort of dollar figure is. This one's maybe less. Right. And, and to that point, like I might be more willing to support it if it's X dollar than if it's Y dollar. So that's why, like, how do we even know what we're putting on in the budget or the agenda without having an agenda item to discuss the, the framework of that policy? <laughs> so I think it, so, so thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Combs, for, uh, for uh, Council Member Combs, for bringing up the um, health care. I think it would be very important to understand how much we're looking to, to research. So I think it's important between stipend, PERS. I, I believe that there's already been some research about that. So I'm, I'm hoping that that doesn't require as much research. And then the third thing uh, is related to uh, health care. So if the Council wants all of those things considered, um, it, it'll be a little bit iterative about that. Would about you like us to weigh in on where research. we're at with that right like, now to help you? Yes. Like okay. if, if you have no interest whatsoever in, like, okay. say, say, for example, the, the health care, that'd be good to know so we don't uh, invest the time. Okay. In so I'd like to then, I appreciate you clarifying. So, Council Member Combs, let's okay. start with you. Yeah, totally fair. Um, I do want to say, <clears throat> I appreciate um, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor uh, bringing this up. Um, we, before it was agendized, we, we had a, a, a discussion um, about it, and I know it was something that a um, a, a commissioner had expressed um, some interest in exploring. And so, I it, think it, it's a great value that it it, um, it is something that we, even as we make we're we're discussing only whether we want to go to the next step, that it at least has gotten this far. So, I, I will say that I'm not interested in exploring it on any level. Um, and and I would would stain try to not get into the merits, but for providing some some um, some transparency as, as my my thinking, um, I don't really accept the argument that it, it, it increases the pool um, because again I, I think it's one of those things where you put it out there and you say it increases the pool, but I don't know if it really increases the, the pool because it would still need to be like a, a nominal amount. Um, and then I, I do have some concerns about then what's an additional sort of for the infrastructure that comes into to having to like then on the staff side you, you, you know manage it to and it's additional w2s that have to get sent out and all all, all that comes comes along with that um and, and again like i don't think that the the, the trade-off is is there and then my concerns is what what does if once you're sort of paying for something a service what additional responsibilities come onto us um, as it relates to the performance that 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 is that is occurring on, on the commissions um you, you know then do we need to look more closely uh, than we do now at attendance like right um does does that come into play even tonight i, I think we had a, a scenario where two commissioners had abstained and i didn't clearly understand why they abstained <laughs> and so um uh to um and it, it it's not and in one case according to staff the commissioner provided no reason why they abstained and so i think it becomes a different dialogue and framing if now there is stipend that that's or there's money being paid that i want to be like okay well then we maybe need to spin up and a, a regular performance review process um to look at commission and so that adds more to the infrastructure so again I know I went into mayors but please forgive me but I do want to understand I, I appreciate that we we had this discussion because I, I like important people in the community wanted to bring it but I, I I I'm not I'm not there thank you council member Counts. um council member Nash your door 
So I actually started not wanting to do any of it and did some, um, just to, for exactly pretty much what you had said in the, um, and after doing a very minimal amount of research, which I see council member Dorr did as well, um, my thought was um, San Jose does $200 per month for commissions. And um, they actually do it on a need-based basis. And the city of Burlingame used to do $200 a month for planning commissions. So I was really thinking, and I know that Redwood City has recently in 20, and within the last two years, has been talking about it, but because they're a charter city, it's more involved for them. So I don't, and I don't recall seeing any amount of money that they were talking about. But I was thinking about um, it in, this, in the framework of just a flat, like $200 per month for our planning commission. And I know I'm now going into merits, but I don't know how to do that one. So, um, to me, I would be interested in some sort of um, in doing some sort of pilot program, or at least talking about it, but only as like a two hundred dollar per month um, for planning. Very honestly, and to talk about it with um, to plan for it in the budget, and then to have some sort of discussion and staff report um, in um, thinking about going to the next um, recruiting cycle. And non personable. Correct. Yeah, I just a flat two hundred dollars, no benefits, and no benefits. And I actually would not even do financial um, based. I would just do it straight across the board. Um, just keep it simple. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. What my council, uh, other council members have shared here. Uh, some things I'm thinking about are how useful stipends can be to increase the accessibility of spaces and the great opportunity we have in the park to have even more representative, diverse leaders from diverse incomes and ages, et cetera, on our commissions. Um, I also re resonate with questions that Council Member Colm shared about how useful it really is. I mean, as a council member, we get, uh, is it $600 a month? And, you know, that's not a livable income, uh, you know, thinking about different things. And so I want to make sure that whatever is offered uh, is useful and could actually create some kind of new access, new opportunity. Um, and so, but given, the, you know, I'm holding two things in my mind, the duality of, of this question, as well as the importance of accessibility um, and how a little bit of financing can help that. And so looking at the example of San Jose, looking at uh, with PG&E, the CARE program, which is the a program that offers a bit of a discount for folks uh, based on income. Um, I wonder if some sort of explicit criteria like that would be useful to then say, okay, if you meet this criteria, you are eligible for, as San Jose did, maybe a $200 a month something. So it's definitely not uh, at all, um, you know, uh, an income level, but it is it is something. So it can at least pay, help pay for gas, help pay for something. Um, I'm not sure, I, something that I would be curious about if the city were to explore these options um, is showing us a few different scenarios. So one scenario where it would be only the planning commission and uh, or and within that also the financial criteria. And maybe another option where, okay, if we did for all commissions and we had assumed, you know, one or two people from each commission needed that financial uh, assist or that financial aid stipend, something like that, um, how much would that be? I would be interested in seeing that. Um, I would note that on just pr providing it to the planning commission, um, my hope is that in future conversations with the council, we can do things to better streamline our planning processes uh, so their role can be maybe of a similar level of commitment as our other commissions, um, just to, to lighten the load there. So that's something I'm thinking about. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Um, and in terms of benefits and PERS level? Interested in not- Not, not interested, okay. So um, I am pretty much in alignment with 
my colleagues to the side here, Council Member Doran, Council Member Nash. Um, I, I'm actually thinking, what problem are we trying to solve here? So is the problem to give people a living wage? Like there's no way we can give people a living wage. We don't get a living wage. Like it's just not gonna happen. Is it to um, like motivate people and get them excited to come out and kind of give them like an incentive or a reward? Maybe, um, is it to cover maybe uh, babysitting or gas or uh, slight compensation of their time, like an acknowledgement of their time? Yes. So in, in that sense, I was also kind of getting at the $200 a month um, idea in my head. Um, I'm open to um, staff's recommendation on whether it be needs space or across the board. I would defer to what's the easiest to implement. Um, I don't want you spending a whole bunch of process to try to save us $200 for a planning commissioner and that, that costs $10,000 for you to come up with the system. <laughs> um, so um, that's that's what I'm thinking. I'm also thinking the planning commission makes a lot of sense because they're quasi judicial. They actually have a regulatory role um, where not that our other commissioners aren't highly valued and we love their work and we appreciate them, but the planning commissioner is more of like a serious um, commitment. So that makes sense in terms of the distinction. So um, it sounds like, well, I obviously want to hear from Vice Mayor Taylor now that she's heard everyone's thoughts, but it sounds like at least three of us are gelling around the idea of around a $200, whether it's needs-based or not, piloting it with the Planning Commission, um, seeing how that goes, and then um, and then going from there. So um, I'd love to hear from Vice Mayor Taylor. Uh, like my colleagues, I appreciate you bringing this up. And um, please. Thank you. Uh, I am supportive of what you're supportive of. Um, I think a pilot would be great. And and whatever is not going to take a lot of staff um, to see. Um, I think the value in it for me, well, one is that it has commissioner brought it to my attention, but the other is the value in volunteering and not feeling valued. So the dollar amount isn't as important as it is to say, hey, we have a site of work. So whether it's a dollar or a thousand dollars, um, just something I think our commissioners committing to the city and, and, and some don't feel valued. Um, I just see our role as being invaluable. And one day someone will come to the council and request that council members receive a living wage. <laughs> <laughs> Around here, that might be challenging, but <laughs> probably, there's probably a lot of room between $600 a month and a living wage still. So we'll see. Um, I don't believe that's in front of us this evening. Yeah. A council member comes to you. Want to say anything else? Uh, no, no. I, uh, yeah, I'm supportive of. Well, I'm um, not supportive of the direction <laughs> the council is going to, but I, I want to acknowledge. Um, that I understand where, where the, the council support for this is, is coming. My question is, so will it be retroactive? Uh, yeah, so we'll be looking. Um, so then for um, staff, then I believe the direction would be as you're building the budget to, to um, look around that $200 range, um, uh, just to get a sense would you be inclined to start at the beginning of the fiscal year or at the calendar year when we or the next recruitment? Yeah, uh, next recruitment. Okay. Um, so that'll save us a few dollars anyway. <laughs> so um, um, so then this would be looking to be implemented not until uh, April or May or, or whatever next year. So I think we have a lot of time. What was that? So next annual. Recruitment. Next annual recruitment. So this will be we're building up, we're getting there. Change is slow, but um, we'll, we'll build that in. Yes, Councilmember Nash. I'd be interested if it is needs based, is that something that be, can be kept confidential? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we got somewhere. Um, uh, City Manager Murphy, do you need, or City Clerk Karen, is there a motion needed for that? Yes. We'll okay, motion so, in a second. Uh, just with the okay, so I'll go ahead and make the motion, which is to 
not do any one of these unless council uh, i'm sorry vice mayor no, taylor okay. would you like to make the motion no. would you like me to state it and then you okay all right i will make the motion to um add a fifth option of what the council will do which is to direct staff to um build in in the budget development a stipend um not to exceed two hundred dollars a month for planning commissioners only we're piloting this as a pilot um we're leaving it to staff discretion whether it'll be needs-based or for everybody depending on if unless staff wants to apply now um and then for it to begin at the next annual recruitment of planning commissioners uh city Ma manager murphy do you have any questions? Sorry, uh, just to clarify uh, um I wouldn't say it's for staff discretion. I think staff would just provide the options for the council. I, I guess I, I would generally lean now towards uh, keeping it simple and not have, especially since it's limited to the planning commission, seven people not that's, making it need day. So if you want to kind of okay, let's just, things. It's a pilot too. So let's do, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'll just say, so I'm going to vote against this, but I'll just say that, like, yeah, I think that that's the right way to go. Great. Um, especially because some um, commissioners will not accept it anyway, like, right? And and so, so so it will you know some commissioners will say they they don't they want it you know, so. and we are not disclosing whether we accept our six hundred dollars a month at this time. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's not on the agenda. Um, so, City Clerk Karen, do you have the motion then? So, okay, do you? I need a second. Okay, so I I'm making the motion. I'm Vice second. Mayor Taylor is seconding it. So uh, I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willis and then a second by Vice Mayor Taylor to direct staff to build into the budget development a stipend not to exceed $200 a month as a pilot for the planning commission beginning April of 2024. Yes, Council Member Nash. I would like to just make it $200 a month rather than not exceed. <laughs> I will accept that, that request. Stipend for $200 a month as a pilot. Yes, that's number door. Um, I have a question on when would we re-examine it if it is a pilot, but it would come back to us. <laughs> and if, if maybe in the next time we, we talk about this, if that could be shared back a proposal for next steps. Yes, yeah, so I kind of stated now most likely to be through through that scenario that's just been described next year's budget cycle. And, and, and perhaps I'm just throwing out your job, but maybe once we do the recruitment next year, we ask like a little question on a checkbox, like what, you know, what motivated you or how, how much did this motivate you or something? I don't know. Um, okay. So a motion in a second is on the floor. I believe it's time to vote. So yes. Great. Okay. So again, I have the motion on the floor by Mayor Wilson and a second by Vice Mayor Taylor to direct staff to build in the budget development, a stipend for two hundred dollars a month as a pilot for the planning commission beginning April twenty twenty four. Any further city council question discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, city council member Combs. No. City council member Dower. Yeah. City council member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor. Yes. Mayor Willis. Yes. And the motion passes with city council member Combs dissenting. Thank you. I was looking at you again, City Clerk Karen. Sorry. I think being in a different space, it just has a different feel. Okay, we're moving on to J, informational items. Informational items are transmitted to the City Council in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a City Council member, City staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comments on the informational items? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public would like to provide comment on any of our informational items, J1, City Council agenda topics, J2, update on the Bellhaven traffic calming plan implementation, J3, Bellhaven school redesign update, J4, update on Kelly Park athletic field, turf and track renovation project, or J5, update on West Bay encroachment agreement for work near Bedwell Bayfront Park. Please engage that hand feature at the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. 
And our first speaker will be Chris McIntosh. Good evening, uh, City Council. Um, thank you very much. I would like to speak to item J5, the uh, West Bay Sanitary District encroachment. Um, I am with Friends of Bedwell Bayfront Park. I'm a longtime park user and have some concerns about a couple of things. The um, first, the alternate trail when the uh, perimeter trail is going to be uh, closed in order for this uh, project to happen. It's not clear, it hasn't been made clear to me how long that trail will be closed. Will it just be a couple of days now and again, or will it be months at a time? Um, the alternate trail could be a problem for park users because it kind of goes uphill. It is fairly wide and it is paved, but it's not as flat for those people who don't do as well on um, hilly terrain. Um, and I wondered if that had been taken into consideration. But also um, wondering how these changes, these impacts are being um, given to the public. I haven't read anything about this in the almanac or, or seen anything. And I wonder if you will be um, letting the public know or getting input from the public before all this happens. Um, you know, it's, or will they just arrive and oops, all of a sudden I can't go round the way I used to. Um, that, so that public access and the trail rerouting and the timing of that is a concern. The other is uh, during the Bay Canal work, a lot of the workers who came, who commuted to the project parked in the park spaces and that used up a lot of the parking lots all day long. Will you be requiring that this public, this this project, the workers have to park on West Bay's land um, and not in the parks parking spaces? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on any of our informational items, J1 through J5. Seeing no hands or cards, no one listening may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. Um, so does any member of staff um, know any of the answers to the questions that um, Ms. McIntosh raised about trail access, parking lot um, access, and other things? Thank you. Ms. Nagaya. Just a minute to figure out the microphone. It's my turn to struggle. Oh, it's exactly. Thank you. So, thank you, Nagaya, Deputy City Manager, and I appreciate Ms. McIntosh's questions about the encroachment agreement. Um, there's a diagram attached to the staff report that shows for a period of time when West Bay is doing the construction work, uh, there will need to be a section of the trail that's closed. We're working with them as best we can to try to minimize those closures and also make sure that um, the contractor that they ultimately ultimately select uh, can open the trail during the construction activity so long as the work zone is safe and people can move through the area when they're not actively working in that particular spot. So we don't anticipate that it's going to be closed for uh, months at a time. But there, there will be a duration of time when that section is closed. We don't have that date quite yet, or the range quite so, yet. So following up, Ms. Nagaya, on that point, um, I know that if I had mobility issues, well, if I had mobility issues and um, my choice of whether I was going to come recreate um, was dependent on whether that trail was open or not, Will there be a because it sounds like if the construction workers are just you know we're not using it now we're opening it we're closing it will there be some kind of way for folks to know which it is? So I think we'll we'll need to circle back with West Bay a little bit more about the particulars of the the closure and the, the impacts of the construction. Um, I think the um, the overall kind of um, 
planned alternative route is instead of doing a loop around the park, you can do out and back, um, which is uh, a not much less uh, a much longer trip than for, for using the, the perimeter trail because you're traversing the majority of the park perimeter and then circling back instead of moving through that area. Um, so that's definitely something we can follow up with with West Bay on get some more information. We've already included in the encroachment agreement and um, uh, steps that they will need to take for, for parking management, for um, notifications. When this came to the council in December, you had also requested outreach materials be done in English and Spanish. So they're, they're tracking that as part of their outreach plan. Um, and then we also recognize that um, uh, there need, there would need to be signage kind of from the parking lot so that we're alerting people uh, that they don't circumnavigate most of the park and then uh, find that the trail is closed. So those things we've all, um, we've flagged for coordination with them, but I think we just need to circle back with a couple more questions. Thank you, Ms. Nagaya and um, Vice Mayor Taylor have a question. Thank, thank you, Ms. Nagaya. And you said that they have an outreach plan so at this point, we required as a condition of the encroachment agreement that they develop an outreach plan. Okay. So that they're still working on that, but acknowledging uh, the feedback that we heard in December was um, in particular for outreach in, in both English and Spanish. Okay. And, and just to, to what Ms. McIntosh said, that there wasn't any communication about whatever I guess is happening now. So would that need to be included too with this process? Since we're, I'm thinking about two different staff reports. One has an outreach plan. Does this one have one as well? Or? So um, we've specifically requested um, outreach to the Friends of Federal Bayfront Park that the West Bay get in touch um, with them uh, about the, the potential impacts to park users and make sure that they're, they're coordinated. So we'll follow up with them and make sure that that particular outreach occurs. Um, I think the outreach plan that they're developing is um, for the construction activity. So notification around what construction will look like, what the impacts will be, what the duration will, will include. Um, so that, that's what's still in, in development at this point in time. Perfect. Thank you. So following up on the construction impacts, um, I believe Ms. McIntosh's other question had to do with parking lot um, availability of spaces with construction activity? Correct, yep. Yeah. And so, um, yes, the parking um, management is one aspect of um, what the contract will be required to prepare and submit as part of their permitting process with the city. Um, so we would, in, in our intention is to maximize the amount of parking that happens on West Bay property and minimize the, the impacts to, to the park. Thank you, and thank you for thinking through all these things. And here's uh, Councilmember Nash. Does, is the outreach the responsibility of West Bay or the city? So um, as part of the encroachment agreement, we're, we're requiring West Bay to do the outreach. Um, but I think because we are the owner of the property and the operator owner of the park, our intention is to also be involved throughout, throughout the process. Thank you, Ms. Nagaya. Um, are there any other questions, comments about any of the informational items? Okay. Um, then we're going to go to K, which is the city manager's report. Mr. Murphy. Yes, sir. Thank you. This, uh, this evening, I don't have a, too, too much to report necessarily, but the um, next city council meeting would be the um, uh, 18th, which is a uh, interview for the um, planning commission. Uh, so again, one last pitch for applicants until this Friday's deadline and the uh, next regular city council meeting will be uh, on table. Thank you, um, city manager Murphy. Um, any council member reports? Council member comes. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's not a council member report. I think more of a council heads up. Um, this is not an official initiated action request at the moment, but um, 
um, over the past couple of weeks, I've um, had a number of conversations with residents um, in connection with um, our heritage tree workers. Um, and as someone who was uh, chair of the heritage tree task force that brought us our current uh, ordinance, I felt we need an obligation to, to engage in these, uh, and a special obligation to, to engage in these set of laws. Um, and, um, and and sort of recognize that there might be areas of, of improvement or, or just areas that maybe need to be revisited um, given um, current current circumstances. And so um, as a heads up at this point, and again, these dialogues continue because I want to come with something a little bit more concrete than, than our, uh, a general sort of relooking at the heritage tree uh, ordinance, but, um, but that, that is something that, that will likely um, be a great council initiated to ask them in the future. Thank you, Council Member Collins. Council Member Nash. Thank you. Um, first of all, just to comment on that, um, if I may, and that's just the EQC, the Environmental Quality Commission, has a subcommittee um, that is tasked with heritage tree uh, work and looking at the heritage tree ordinance, I believe, at least they have some, they, it's a heritage tree task force, um, and they definitely have responsibility for a heritage tree. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, do a report out basically. Last weekend, I drove around here in the Bayfront area, looking at the massive new construction projects here. And two things really jumped out at me. One was the huge buildings and how they're sort of all one on top of another. And it's just asphalt and buildings. And then the other realization is that the area really lacks basic services, stores for everyday essentials, and also transportation. And this is just increasing the traffic and pollution pollution for everyone. And I strongly recommend the council members, commissioners, staff, and the public all take time to go out and look at these huge new developments and think about solutions. It's it was quite high. Even though I've I've even within the last month, it's just um really grown and it's worth looking at. Um, Council Member Dorr, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, so uh, my report out is that on um, April 22nd, Saturday, April 22nd, um, as what has been mentioned is Earth Day and the Love Our Earth Festival. Um, also that Friday to Sunday is a conference called the Progress Seminar which is hosted by um, the San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce, which now we, Menlo Park has kind of folded into. Um, so I have registered um, with the city to attend that conference. Um, I may try to be in two places at once and attend that conference Friday night and then come back for the earth thing on Saturday. I'm not sure how long I'll be there, but. I think it's important to build relationships with our new chamber and with our regional leaders. So I wanted to, I, I don't remember exactly what the travel policy is, but I did want to let council know that I will be attending. I won't be signing anything on behalf of the city. I will be probably wearing a badge that says mayor, um, just a heads up. Uh, and yes. So um, with that, if there's nothing else, um, it is 10.03 and I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you.